We are, as far as I can see, we are live on YouTube. And we are live on Rockfin, where we are actually uncensored and without algorithmic um, manipulation. So shout out to everybody watching on Rockfin. And uh, hello to all of our friends on YouTube. I am very pleased to introduce to you Frederick Leroy. Dr. Frederick Leroy actually has a real PhD, not the type of PhD that Klaus Schwab has, not an honorary PhD. He's got a real PhD. And um, yeah, Dr. Frederick Leroy, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a long time coming. I've been, I've been bugging you to come on and chat about this topic for a while, and I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you for having me, Tristan. I apologize Great. for being so so late. In, well, in you know, I mean, maybe I didn't bug you enough. I know I asked you a couple of times, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't, didn't want to wear you down. So, um, yeah, Dr. Leroy, can you just give a quick introduction uh, to people, about, give a little bit on your background, how you got into this topic that we're going to be uh, hitting on today, which the topic for today, we are talking about, uh, we're talking about global food control. We're talking about the great diet reset, you know, resetting the table, as the Rockefeller Foundation calls it. Uh, we're talking about Davos, the UN, sustainable development goals, um, new age cults, and global food systems. How did you get into this and how did you begin looking into this topic? Yeah, uh, well, uh, very unconventionally, I think. Um, I, I, so my background is in food science. I'm a food scientist and technologist, a bit of nutrition, a bit of food microbiology, a bit of food technology, with an expertise uh, specifically in the domain of animal source foods. And because animal source foods are really, really the, the the part of our diets that get most attention nowadays, and some very bizarre things are going on, and it's, it becomes very surreal at some moments. And um, because of that, I started to just to explore why my topic of research became controversial, and by mm. doing so, I, I started to uncover some very uh, remarkable connections um, between how uh, people at policy levels. Uh, and uh, people in, 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 the, in the corporate world and people with more ideological ideas um, are rolling out scenarios that basically imply that we steer away as much as possible from animal source foods and, and meat in particular, but also the other ones. And mm -hmm. by investigating, I, I bumped into all sorts of very bizarre uh, constellations basically of, of power centers and more esoteric uh, groups that all somehow blend in into um, really uh, irrational um, irrational approach to, to the food system. And, and basically we all know that the food system needs to improve. I mean, there's this work to be done at the food system level, but the way this is being handled is absolutely is absolutely amazing and um that's how i ended up here in this um in this mess basically um i, I mean I, I could ask you a million questions just about your work as in in, in food technology because i mean, you're, I mean you, you've been studying fermentation fermented meat products which is interesting that the un has classified these suddenly suddenly these are processed meats right salami yeah. um charcuterie and a lot of these you know kind of foods that our ancestors have developed and used for thousands of years is highly nutritious, bioavailable, and actually very healthy foods. All of a sudden, these are considered processed meats. I think that's kind of a that's kind of a strange development that's happened in the last few years, right? But there's not there's nothing wrong with the world with with the denomination of being processed meats. I mean, processing is not a, is not a bad terminology. I mean, this it's absolutely beneficial to process things. That's why we're humans. We use technology to process things. Mm -hmm. And most likely even uh, processed meats are the very first interventions we ever did at technological level in, in our, uh, at, at the level of food since mm -hmm. Paleolithic times. So it's probably the, the, the very, o the oldest food technology we have is probably, is probably meat technology. So those mm -hmm. processed meats, they go back all the way to our very first days as, as, um, as humans. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm a, I'm obsessed with processed meats, and I think this word itself has become so loaded, right? Yeah. Like it, it means that it's automatically bad. But if you think ground beef is processed meat, I mean, you're you're, you're grinding it up as soon yeah. as you butcher the animal and drain the blood from it. That, that's processed. Exactly. Um, yeah. So that makes drying meat animal. or or salting meat or anything you you any intervention we we have using tools and and, and specific purpose of, of preservation or or quality enhancement or safety enhancement is processing and that's absolutely fine actually that's that's a plus now ultra processing is where things go wrong and then the two are conflated and that's where the mistake is i think uh, processing is just fine we should be glad right. of that processing. Right. So you're know, cooking your potatoes, you're processing the food. Right. Um, yes. Making, uh, you know, Frito Lay's chips and putting them in a bag and sending them halfway around the world, that would be an ultra processed food. And unfortunately for our health, a lot of these ultra processed foods are now being called green, sustainable, part of a great food transition. And uh, so there, there's some very strange stuff going on with marketing. And um yeah, they, I would, I'd love to get into that. So this this idea of the planetary health diet, um, sustainable development of our food systems, a great food transition. You've done such a great job at mapping out a lot of these ideas, a lot of the political, uh, the NGO and uh, corporate influences on our food system. And yeah, let, let's jump into this, the, uh, the, the, the planetary health diet the great food transition or the great food transformation, the great reset. Um, when, when did this jump onto your radar and how did you, uh, how did you become interested in this topic? Well, it, it started with the, with the eat Lancet diet mostly. Uh, when I first picked it up, I mean, I was on, I was looking at it before uh, and, and I was, at some point in time, I did a study on on a discourse analysis uh, and uh, just mapping how discourses on meat and health evolved of, over the first 15 years of this century. And then 2015, the IARC report came out, and that's the one you alluded to before. So that's the, the World Health Organization saying that processed meats are uh, carcinogen. That was 2015. So um, and that that accelerated the the whole the whole dynamic. And then a couple of years later, the Lancet report came out, so the planetary health diet that suggests that we should uh, reduce our consumption of animal source foods in general, uh, all of them, eggs and fish and meat to very, very low levels mm -hmm. and go plant-based, not fully plant-based, even though they allow so. I mean, they also allow for a vegan option, but that you should go mostly plant-based and you have very, very, very small proportions of animal source foods. And, uh, and they call that... The planetary health diet which means that it should be implemented globally and it should be implemented to something you just mentioned a great food transformation now that, that's the terminology was very interesting because with a bit of research um, you can find out that this terminology doesn't come out of the blue the great food transformation the great transformation is something that is in the mindset of uh, those big utopian planners since since a while you know, all those mm. great transformations, those great transitions, they uh, have been going around since decades. And and then you, you start understanding that this Eat Lancet diet is not just something that came out in that specific year. It was 2018, I think, or 2019. I'm losing track. Yeah. Uh, but this is something in the making since since many years. At least the groundwork has been laid out since, since several decades. And the players involved in the Eat Lancet uh, commission and, and in the Great Food Transformation those players are going back all the way to to uh, the Rio conference and before that. Hmm. Um, yeah, so we're talking about you know the, uh, the the Rio conference, the Agenda 2030, Agenda 21. Um, sustainable development goals were developed. I think it was this 1992 was the Rio conference, right? Yes, right. Yes, yes. So, and then I, at some point in time, I bumped into the work of uh, of Corey Morningstar. And mm, yes. uh, she was uh, laying out all the players behind the um, sustainable development agendas. And, mm. and to, to my surprise at first, I saw that she was mentioning the exact same organizations as the ones that I was finding that were just, you know, in, in, in the dietary compartments, the exact same yes. ones. 
Yes, and then uh, this a lot of this goes back to like the Club of Rome, the Rockefeller Foundation, yeah. a lot of really big yeah, money. The World Resources Institute, the um, WWF, uh, you, you name them, the, the Stockholm Institutes, all those organizations mm -hmm. go back to to you know to, to the momentum that has been um, uh, launched at, to the to the um, how, how can I say this? At some point in time, uh, especially. Uh, in the late 1960s, um, there was a, a reconfiguration of, of certain ideas and mindsets into specific organizations. And those ones have been developing over time. And, uh, and, and that culminated in the planetary health diet. So it's not something that was just invented. And, and I'm yeah. not saying that it's necessarily always consciously so, but it's, it's, um, it's a historical dynamic. It builds on on a, on a historical process. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I see what you're getting at there. I mean, it's like, it's not that this, these things don't just arise in a vacuum, exactly. right? I mean, uh, there's this idea that, uh, the, the concept of, uh, that was it that wrote that wrote that book ideas have consequences. Right. Um, and you know, the, the historical flow mm. of ideas, uh, and it, our worldviews influence our behavior. And, um, you know, so the idea of the planetary health diet, I think what you've what you've done a, a really good job is is pointing that pointing to the fact that this idea goes back to these groups like the Club of Rome, who you know funded through uh, you know other organizations like the Rockefeller Foundation, and these ideas about rearranging our style of life in this kind of almost utopian kind of new age mm. actually ends up being religious at a certain level reorganization of the whole world and how we live, how we see ourselves, how we see the planet, how we see our diet. These these are not just, you know, simply economic manipulations. These are not just, yeah, I mean, it goes beyond that. Yeah, it is, and that's important to mention because sometimes people say follow the money and the money is, is one part of the story. And there are some, and, and the corporations are there to make money. I mean, the ones that support this program and, and, and the you know, classical food multinationals, they are there because they, they, they see an opportunity, clearly. But it's, it's a mosaic of different players with different interests and, and somehow they all find each other. Uh, and that's why they collaborate, but they have different intentions. They don't all have the same goal. I mean, yeah. in, in, in those networks, you have, you have several clusters and, and all those different clusters have different intentions and different uh, motivations, but somehow they all find each other in this, in this monster <laughs> that is, you know, yeah. that is just, uh, the, the hydra that we're seeing, because it's actually, it's, it's not just a monster, it's a multi-headed monster that and you, it, it's very difficult to, to understand uh, the network if you don't um, crack the code. But if you crack the code, I mean, you cannot unsee it. <laughs> yeah. It is all very much interrelated. Exactly. And, and a lot of this, these ideas, they do go back to this kind of neo-Malthusian idea that there are limited resources, we're running out of resources, we don't have enough resources, and we need to manage the resources, including the human resources, in order to bring about this new enlightened state. So it's kind of this idea, it's almost yeah. like a platonic republic uh, of, you know, the, the, the enlightened philosophers at the World Economic Forum and at these NGOs and, uh, you know, and, and corporations. Uh, and uh, they don't, a lot of these people don't literally believe this, but this, it, it does kind of function almost as this like platonic republic of, you know, the enlightened philosophers, almost, you know, Francis Bacon's invisible college of, of, of enlightened scientists who will manage the world and, and, uh, and, and feed everybody and clothe everybody. And it's a very utopian idea. Um, mm. And, you know, I mean, when you, when you look back at like the, 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 uh, the Club of Rome, right? The Club of Rome, for instance, which was, was it like 1968 that the Club of Rome put out limits to growth? Um, well, a, a bit later, but yes, in, uh, early 70s, I think. No? Oh, 70, maybe 72, 71 yeah. or two. And that was the same time that the World Economic Forum came around, yeah, which yeah. is interesting. Yeah. Yes. So how do these how do these ideas connect? You know how did how did the Club of well, Rome and some of these yeah um, maybe at this stage up? at this stage, Tristan, maybe I can and sh can share my screen and we can have a look Please. at some uh, more details because uh, and, and this is this is part of why I love speaking to uh, Dr. Leroy here because he has done such a great job at mapping these and using visuals. Um, so yeah, we we are uh, fortunate that he will be able to share a lot of this, and you guys can find him. He's got a great Twitter his Twitter account. He's got a lot of these resources that he puts up on his Twitter. It's at F Leroy, F L E R O Y 
find over there on Twitter. Uh, Keep on filling in for me. I'm have something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So yeah, he's he's done a great job at kind of creating these visual maps of some of these, you know, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, for instance, and how, uh, you know, the WBCSD, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, uh, is essentially a group of global corporations. In fact, it's the group of group of global corporations that are actually polluting the world the most <laughs> and destroying our ecosystems at such a rapid pace. But they've come together and they've branded themselves as, you know, these enlightened um these this enlightened council of of loving elders who will just steward us into this new system of the great food transformation. So here we go. We've got we can see it, and I can still You'll see, see you. All right. I know okay. you could probably only see the. Uh, yeah, I uh, just see the full screen. Um, so you interrupt me when whenever needed, right? Uh, no problem. No problem. Yeah, and 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 likewise, if I, I I hope not to interrupt and ramble too much, but you you get me excited here with these, <laughs> especially the visuals. You could do such a great no, you, job with this. You interrupt me at any time. Uh, so so what you see on this screen here is at the center. You see the great food transformation. Okay. So this is from this is the from the Eat Foundation. So the Eat Foundation that wants to move to work, to, wants the whole planet to move towards a planetary health diet. That's the great food transformation. Now on the left, you see the World Economic Forum. And in the, uh, so the Davos meeting of 2012 was called the great transformation. Uh, and then of course, you know them from the great reset as well. So it's all great. And, and then uh, at the right side, you have uh, WBGU, uh, which is a German institution. We'll come back to all those uh, organizations later. And they talk about the great transformation as well. Um, and then below you have the TELUS Institute and they talk about the great transition. So it's all about great transformations and great transitions. It sounds and great so far. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in, in principle, the idea is, is okay. You, know? you want to <laughs> transform and make it better. Mm. It, it just, you know, the plans they have are not necessarily the plans we, we should agree with. But I mean, as an idea, it's about transforming and improving. Um, so that that's that's OK. But we'll, we need to look at the details to understand that it's maybe not all that um, all, all, all that close to what the people actually want. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, what, what's interesting here is that the terminology is uh, is the same and all those players are interconnected very closely. Um, and uh, also, for instance, the transformation, the great transformation of uh, WBGU is uh, in the same year as the World Economic Forum meeting. Well, I think it's probably it was pre pre prepared in 2011 and it was published in 2012 or something, but it's more or less the same chronology. So this is a, 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 a diagram where you see it's very, it, it looks very complicated, I, I suppose, but uh, I try to organize a bit the the various players and, and actors within the act actor networks kind of, of system. And on the left side, you see great transitions, great reset, great food transformation, great uh, transformation. And uh, and there's a there's a flux going from the right to the left, okay? And uh, something that is very central here is uh, the role of Maurice Strong. It's the, it's the orange circle you see on the yeah. right. Ma Maurice Strong, who, you know, I forget what the episode was called, but I did do a, a deep dive on Maurice Strong, his uh, his strange checkered history. I mean, he's very influential. He's basically uh, like the, kind of like the Rockefeller of Canada. Um, yeah, well, he, he was, he was essentially, he was essentially a Rockefeller frontman. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and we'll talk about Rockefellers <laughs> because you see already uh, Stephen Rockefeller and Lawrence Rockefeller on the, on, on the Rockefeller Foundation. You see David Rockefeller. <clears throat> um, so there are several Rockefellers involved in in the uh, wider, more strong you know, bubble. Yes, and so and, and just to uh, throw this in there too, the Rockefeller Foundation. We've done a, a few several hour deep dives on the Rockefeller Foundation, and this is the the nexus point. This was the uh, the group that kind of pioneered this idea of public private partnerships, which is exactly. very yeah. prominent in this great transformation, great reset agenda. Exactly. And that was in 1913 that they started pushing these ideas of government and corporation working together in uh, and actually like wartime style partnerships in order to bring about um, you know, new economic models and uh, you know, it's essentially advancing 
business agenda as well as ideological agenda. And the Rockefeller Foundation is obsessed with this idea of the new science of man, which mm -hmm. um, I would very much recommend anybody in the audience check out the book by Lily E. K. called the uh, Caltech, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the Rise of the New Biology, which details how the life sciences, the social sciences, the physical sciences were greatly influenced by NGO, big money coming from corporate um, American interests, pushed through the Rockefeller Foundation and pu public-private partnerships with the ultimate end and idea of transforming man himself, which is going to come into play, of course, here with the Great Reset, the Fourth Industrial Revolution, Great Food Transformation. I mean, this all goes back to, you know, their early 1900s. Um, and, and it goes further back than that, as if you want to trace the ideas back. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. And then, but then, of course, you have the whole te technocracy movement as well from the 1930s that also somehow blends in in, in, in this. Um, so Maurice Strong is, is, is mostly known as the founder of UNEP, so the United Nations Environmental Programme. And uh, as such, he is, he is the uh, initiator of the Stockholm Conference in '72. That's what you see. Can you see my arrow? Yes, sir. Okay. No, so wait, wait. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's right on the UN Stockholm. Yeah, exactly. Right. So this is uh, 72, the United Nations uh, Stockholm Conference. And then, of course, as we said before, the uh, Rio Conference of 92 or the Earth Summit. Uh, so he's behind that, okay? Now, he was also very much involved, not only with the Rockefellers, but he was also involved with the World Economic Forum, uh, with uh, WBCSD, the World Business Council, for sustainable development, um, with the World Bank, with WWF, with uh, the World Resources Institute, with the Stockholm Institutes, and so on. Now, the Stockholm Institute gave birth to the uh, Stockholm Environment Institute. The, the Stockholm Conference, sorry, gave, gave birth to the SEI, the Stockholm Environment Institute. Mm. And they uh, are uh, at the basis of the Stockholm Resilience Center. Okay. Um, and the Stockholm Resilience Center is one of the founders of the EAT Foundation. Then, if we go from the other side, in the Earth Summit, so in the Rio Conference, um, was uh, the occasion for the WBGU to be founded. That's the one that we talked about before, the German institution. Now, WBGU uh, was... Um, is... is um, so the main the main the main person within WBGU is Schellenhuber, which is also the founder of the Potsdam Institute uh, for for Climate (PIK), where now Johann Rockström is replacing him, and Johann Rockström is coming from the Stockholm Resilience Center. Okay, mm -hmm. so you see that all those players here end up in the same cluster, and and those are the ones that bring you those great transformations, great, uh, great transitions and so on, because the Stockholm Environment Institute also is a communicating vessel with the TELUS Institute, which is bringing you the great transitions and so on. So this very complicated graph is just to show you that all the ones that are behind the terminologies here are very closely interconnected and they all somehow go back to the same um, uh, initial cluster of players that start with Maurice Strong and his uh, and his conferences. Mm, right. Maurice Strong is not, back the, to the, not the absolute beginning point, of course. I mean, Maurice Strong mm. is, 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 again, is to be situated in a historical flux. And it maybe looks much more over-determined than it really is in reality, this scheme, because, of course, this is what you get when you, when you schematize things. It looks like it's one big... In, uh, uh, determined system it's it's more complicated than what i'm showing here but this is just to show you the main ideas it, because what's important here is to understand that it's this is a mindset that has been created it's not necessarily a plan it's not necessarily a plan that has been um has been um definitely has been put definitely in all in, in different agenda points and and, and a chronology it's hmm. and, and it's now unfolding that's not necessarily what it is it's the birth of a mindset hmm. and it's like a world, it's a world mindset, view. yeah you see that the mindset is being translated in the ideas of uh, central planners, technocrats, that want to impose transitions upon the world. Well, not and, just the world, right? Also humanity itself, yeah. 
which is, yeah. I mean, really, we're, we're, when you get to that level, I mean, you're talking about our fundamental assumptions on who we are, where we come from, where we're going. And of course, you know, if you, if you influence these ideas, you, you influence the, the culture itself. And, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah. ideas like the fourth industrial revolution talk about actually modifying humanity itself. Right. Right, absolutely. And, and this you find is specifically with organizations like the Telus Institute, for instance. Um, that's really about changing consciousness and changing humans and elevate them to a higher level and so on. It's, mm -hmm. uh, they're flirting also very much with uh, Teilhard de Chardin and uh, the, the, the transition to the Omega point and you name it. So there's yeah. a new age component here that we should talk about. And that's uh, maybe when we should zoom in into more strong. You had an episode on strong, so probably you addressed this, but uh, it, I don't think it harms that we repeat a couple of things. Oh no, this was—I mean, this is probably two years ago. I mean, we, we are—it's right. uh, always relevant, and you know, you probably got I, you know, things here that that I've not covered. So let's get into Maurice Strong. So Maurice Strong, um, uh, again, he's involved in 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 many of the players that we see now. Uh, attached to the, to the great food transformation and all the other transformations in the World Economic Forum and so on. And, and that's because at the time already he was a trustee of the Rockefeller Foundation, so he was the founder of UNEP. He was a long-time foundation director of, of uh, the World Economic Forum. He was a chairman of the World Resources Institute and of the Stockholm Environment Institute. He was on the board of the Bayer Institute, which is also linked to the Stockholm uh, Resilience Center. He was on uh, the council of WWF. Um, IUCN, and uh, he was the co-founder of the Business Council for Sustainable Development that then later became the World Business Council of Sustainable Development. So whatever we're seeing now somehow has a link to Maurice Strong. Now, Maurice Strong, except except of all, you know, except of th th this more classical look at his uh, curriculum, he was also a new age, um, uh, he was very much into new age. Mm -hmm. And especially his wife, uh, Hannah Strong, you see her on the right here and on, on the cover on the right. This is Hannah Strong. Um, and uh, they founded the Manitou Foundation, which is basically a new age center um, where they wanted to unite all religions and, and come up with a world religion for, for the planet. Mm -hmm. So, it's and, and similar how you know, the Rockefeller Foundation funded the World Council of Churches, uh, the kind of ecumenism movement in order to try to blend together all the different denominations and churches into a you know a single religion. And and this idea didn't just go away. You got uh, Pope Francis now pushing for you know interfaith services and prayer and building some giant center. I forget where it was, but. Uh, building a, a large center where all the different religions will have a single temple and worship together in this kind of new Gaian, um, new age religion. The, the, inter, the, the interfaith movement is, is very is very near to the United Nations uh, sphere. Um, mm. and, and the Rockefeller as well. Here you have uh, the little square here is, is Lawrence Rockefeller. He, he was the patron of the Money to Foundation. Um, and he was he was completely out there. This he, he so he was uh, interested in UFOs and and yeah. he was very very new age uh, as well. Mm. And and he funded a lot of the like a lot of the popular UFO lore that you see today. Uh, even I think like Stephen Greer yes. he fund, funds a lot of these groups who make contact with entities and right. um, that's you know spiritualism and and all these ideas do tie into this and they tie into the UFO cult as well which is i mean it's just fascinating how yeah. you know this strange religious new age spirituality ufo cult ties in with um these ideas of transformation of man absolutely and it's not something you would expect from the founder of unip right it's not, this is not the background you would expect mm. for somebody like yeah. this well when you look um, at so, like so even, make... even the world wildlife fund you've got uh julian huxley whose brother was aldous huxley and like julian huxley was very into the idea of transhumanism and he used that term actually kind of pioneered the term transhumanism so yeah i mean it's like you wouldn't expect on the surface but when you do start to dive deep you do you see these connections to uh eugenics even um mm -hmm. and and this idea of man evolving to the next lever level and becoming a, a superman yeah yes it's it's very it's very utopian and um and uh, so this is a bit more, this is not, I mean, we shouldn't read all these things, but these are just some <laughs> uh, <laughs> some fragments um, to say that, uh, so I'm, I'm, you're, 
I don't know if your viewers are aware of this, uh, how, how strong at some point in time uh, purchased uh, land in Colorado. And uh, so, and it's very interesting. The whole story is extremely interesting. Take your time to read it afterwards. But uh, so he, he he bought a piece of land and he bought it from Adnan uh, Khashoggi, which which on itself what? Is, <laughs> is, is already an amazing figure because he was involved in in uh, in all sorts of uh, arms dealing, drugs, yeah. drugs for arms trafficking with the CIA and the Mossad. And I mean, he's yeah. he's already an incredible, interesting um, figure on his own. But uh, but let's leave that alone. So he bought this from, from Khashoggi, and then, at, and so it was called the Baka, and and the idea was to uh, commercialize the underground water systems. Um, but then, of course, people protested because they feared that it would destroy the environment, which is not, I mean, ideal for somebody that pretends to protect the environment. But his idea was to 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 exploit the water, um, the water systems below the the Baka grounds. And at some point, then a local mystic appeared and talked to his wife, to Hannah Strong. And he, so he, he, he told her, well, look, I've been waiting for you. And uh, actually, this place here is going to help to bring forth a new civilization of evolved human beings. There you have it. It's the evolution of human human beings to the next level. The uber and, <laughs> and then they built the Manitou Foundation there, and they, they wanted to make it a, a new age center. And... Uh, start transforming the world from 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 the Baca and from Creston uh, and then the Rockefellers became patrons of, of this foundation and on 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 the um, on those grounds also they uh, they invited the, the Lindisfarne association and and that's a that's a whole different chapter as well but it's so all sorts of new age clusters that were uh, established on his domain <clears throat> and Hannah Strong also was very influential within the United Nations as such, because of course her husband was opening doors for her and she uh, she organized all sorts of very bizarre uh, uh, happenings next to the official United Nations um, agendas. For instance, uh, in 92, during the, the, the UNSET the conference, the, the Earth Summit, uh, she, she organized sacred earth gathering and the wisdom keepers convocation. <laughs> and it's it's, truly truly bizarre and it's all about uh, so it's new age of course and it's all about mm. universal religions and uh, a global ecology of consciousness and so and so forth mm. so it's global spiritual citizenship of you know, yes, exactly. a lot of they talk about like things like ascended masters and a lot of these ideas of yeah. uh yeah. tehard de chardin again you mentioned yes. who you know he was actually a jesuit um, yeah. And you know, so yeah. I mean, it's, it's very, very strange ideas and the new age religion. A lot of people don't realize how influential this new age ideology is. This idea of transforming man, of transhumanism, of uh, you know, the innovation to the level of you know, biological leaps, uh, le leaps in evolution, and it's it really you know the ideas of like Nietzsche's. Um, Ubermensch and uh, you know the, the the Hitlerian ideas that were very popular in the 1930s and uh, in Germany. Uh, a lot of this goes back to like Blavatsky as well, and and the UN does have a, a major connection to this. And the UN's Lucis Trust, Lucius uh, uh, Lucifer Trust, Lucis Lucius Trust Publishing Company uh, published a lot of like Alice Bailey's work talking about the Great White Brotherhood and Ascended Masters and all this. So. Um, yeah, this is not just happening in a vacuum. These ideas are very influential among some of the economic elite. Yeah. So I'm not. I'm not saying here, of course, that that what we talked about before, the, you know, the Eat Lancet diet is, has anything to do with the New Age ideas. But but it's important to understand that this utopian uh, mindset is there since decades, right? And it, mm -hmm. it's translated into something else. But uh, but it has affected the way technocrats look at at, at um, at all systems, uh, and and that's it's not just isolated into the case of of Maurice Strong. It's very pervasive. I, I'll give you a couple of other examples. Um, so this is um, this is from the Telus Institute. Now the Telus Institute and their great transitions are closely linked to the Stockholm Environment Institute and also to the World Resources Institute because Gus Beck is an associate fellow of the Telus Institute and he's the founder of the World Resources Institute as well. So what the Telus Institute is doing is, is designing scenarios. So they, they come up with different scenarios and, and some of them will lead to disaster and others will lead to utopia. 
<laughs> and uh, and it's completely made up, of course. I mean, it has no scientific foundation, even though they present it in scientific manners. <laughs> and uh, so the great transitions are what they really want. So it will lead to eco-communalism or the new paradigm and so on. He's also, so the founder of Telus, uh, Paul Raskin, is also a member of the Club of Rome, and he's uh, in charge of the U.S. Center of the Stockholm Environment Institute. Well, it oh. seems like from, from and I've never heard of the TELUS Institute, but this seems oh, very similar. Yeah, yeah, i got to look into this more. This looks like a very similar to uh, Stanford Research Institute's yeah. The Changing Images of Man idea. Well, all those, all those institutes were, were talking to each other, of course, in those years. Um, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's, it, it, they're influen influencing each other, right? Um and, and you see on the right side, again, you see, again, Guspeth here, and this is a quote. Um, so he says, uh, basically, the environmental problems we're facing now, uh, I, he said, I was thinking that we can solve them through science. But he was wrong because he understood that we should deal with them in a spiritual way. We should achieve spiritual and cultural transformation. There you have it again. You know, it's mm -hmm. about transforming humans and, and societies. Um, and, and bring them to another level, right? What year um, was this that the TELUS Institute started? It looks like the 70s, I guess, from the yes, fonts. I would have to look it up. It could be a bit later, but um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Because it's like, that's the evolve, idea that... You know, these are evolving institutes, and then they, can, they may have yeah. a different nucleus. And, and they might change the name and rebrand yeah. as well. Yeah. And the, But this is right in line with the changing images of man, which I'm sure you've read. Um, yes, and yes, in that, yes document they reach the same conclusions that man needs to be transformed but we the, they basically say the new religion is scientism but yeah. they recognize that there is a metaphysical assumption to this and that you can't just deny metaphysics you can't just uh you, you can't just discard the importance of people's worldviews and their beliefs but they said that even that is something that needs to be transformed with the and it had it was kind of like a cynical view of like looking at worldviews as something that could be used just for utilitarian purposes and and uh and basically shifting people's reality through shifting their view of themselves uh but from a purely like utilitarian worldview point i guess um club of rome said the same thing of like we need a common threat and people will unite against this common threat if they feel like they are part of something bigger uh, like a war movement, like much like World War II, you were able to transform the U.S. economy through that common enemy of um, you know, the Japanese and the axis of evil. They said, like, we need this at a global level. And then that's, you know, global warming was what the Club of Rome said would be the, um, the, the enemy, the threat. Yeah, well, they need, they need something to for people to unite around. So that's, that, that's, yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the goal, too. So people become a herd, become a mob, become a, become a unit, a, a singularity when, when there's a common threat and then they unite. Uh, so that's, that's the idea. Um, on the right side, on the top, you have Stephen Rockefeller, <laughs> another Rockefeller, which is also very much on the spiritual side. And this, this is a publication that he published on the Great Transition website, which is uh, belonging to the uh, Telus Institute. I mean, it's, it's, it's the initiative from the Telus Institute. It's called the Great Transition Initiative. You can find the website. And it's and its subtitle here is Toward a Transformative Vision and Praxis. You see, it's again transforming. Uh, and and he, he talks about all kinds of, again, he was very uh, much fan also of Teilhard de Chardin and all those, uh, you know, evolutions towards perfection and, and towards mm. the Omega point. So but we can go on forever, basically, but this is, uh, this is Robert Muller. I'm sure you're familiar with Robert Muller mm -hmm. and his World Core Curriculum. So he was very high up in, in the United Nations uh, as well. Uh, and he, he was called the philosopher of the United Nations at some point. Uh, he was completely into New Age, uh, too. And, um, and well, he was also uh, important in the uh, University of Peace in Costa Rica. Um, and uh, it was all about, you know, harmony between nature and earth and, and mother earth. And it's very Gaian and it's, it's uh, again, very near to the Chardin.
And of course, these and, ideas like I mean, it's oh, we're going to be in harmony with our environment. Well, this <laughs> this sounds really good, right? But then right. Yes, of course, it, yes. a lot of it's like feel good. It's almost it's like spiritual marketing terms. And really, when it comes down to it, you look at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. It's like BP, Shell, Monsanto, yes. Pfizer. It's like yeah. okay, well, yeah. yeah, you know, Monsanto wants you to be in harmony with Mommy Earth by having you all eat their patented seeds. You know, and it's like it's really it, it it's. It's very strange, you know. The, the, these ideas are marketed to us, and it sounds nice to the average person, and and you're conditioned to accept these as you know feel good, happy. You know, oh, it's a, the happy tolism is one of these weird ones that was exactly. going around. Um, um, stakeholder capitalism. Oh, you're going to be a stakeholder in this new system, but really, it's it doesn't play out that way. <laughs> and then you have Donald Keys. Uh, so he was the speechwriter of uh, U Tent. The, the former UN Secretary General and the founder of Planetary Citizens. Um, and again, a new wager uh, to the point even that his book Earth at Omega, so you have Omega, Passage to Planetization, planetization sorry, uh, is dedicated to his mentors. And among his mentors, you find <laughs> Joao Kuhl and Moria which are two, two well, you can call them demons or, or ascended <laughs> masters or whatever you want, uh, that go all the way back to Blavatsky. Uh, so these are, uh, this is pure theosophy. Uh, and he, he explicitly states them as his mentors. Okay. Um, and then a couple of gurus as well. And, but basically he, he was also the founder of, of planetary citizens. And that's the whole movement towards one, uh, one world, one planet, uh, where uh, there's one uh, governance system, and um, that's why he was also involved in the World Federalist uh, Association. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you, as you can see below, um, this uh, here initiative from the planet, from again the Stockholm Environment Institute and the Telus Institute called the Planetary Phase of Civilization, uh, which is again global scenarios, and, and it's about moving towards that. That phase in, in in history where um, you will you will end up with this elevated consciousness and uh, the, and the Maitreya will come and the ascended masters will share their wisdom and everybody will be one soul and <laughs> it's 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 so bizarre <laughs> it's so incredibly bizarre that this person was a speechwriter of Yutant Yutant being himself very very. Um, very close to various new age ideas as and, and, uh, and, and that's 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 where we're coming from right in in, in those in those years <clears throat> and then let, let's jump <laughs> jump a couple of decades i'm trying to th there's there was some quote from you fans at the beginning of one of these you know kind of you know technocrat books and i thought i was looking through just now i thought it was changing images of man but I don't think it was. Um, but yeah, you Uthant is not he, he he was an influential character. Mm -hmm. And um and again, the ideas that they're propagating, they don't just arise uh, out of a bubble. Remember, like theosophy was very influential throughout the West, uh, spiritism and these ideas that you know seem very irrational. It's interesting that these kind of did arise out of the Enlightenment. Um and you know, the, these ideas of eugenics and a Superman arising, these, uh, the, these ideas were given a scientific veneer, but truly at their core, the idea of transforming man is, is religious. Um, this is not something that's purely rationalistic. This has a very, like you said earlier, an irrational component that is, uh, that is, that is, um, spiritual in nature. <clears throat> Yeah, you, you can trace it back for, I mean, basically theosophy comes from the Swedenborgian church in a way. I mean, Blavatsky, yes. of course, was very idiosyncratic, but it it, got, it builds on the, on the Swedenborgian church. Mm. Um, and then that builds on something else. So it's it's an evolution. And yeah, uh, and just like the, uh, the, with the, the changing images of man, they talk about in the very end, they're like, basically, the new world religion should be based on this universal brotherhood, much like, and they basically they give... Uh, the, the, the example of the ideal global religion is like this eco-consciousness based on Freemasonry. <laughs> it's like that's what they say in this supposedly rationalistic scientific study 
that you know, commissioned Joseph Campbell and then Stanford Research yes. Institute, yeah. which is you know very prestigious university. They're talking about yeah, well, let's let's basically give everybody a new Freemasonic global uh, global <laughs> citizenship religion. <laughs> it's like very strange. Yeah. So that so what you have is this clash between this crazy crazy ideas, and then you have the, the very rational scientific planning side of affairs, right? And those two seem out of touch. They, they don't seem to be compatible, but they somehow they always combine. And uh, this is an example. So this is mo much more recent. Uh, uh, this is the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and they published at some point something called uh, Vision 2050. So their their vision on 2050. I think it was a, a, a brainstorm session where everybody was on asset or something. I don't know. But it, uh, it's called <laughs> oh, it Vision like 2050. <laughs> And, and the World Business Council of Sustainable Development is a very boring organization. I mean, it's it's major corporations that come together to lobby and to defend their, their market interests. So it's, it's boring as can be. Mm. But still, in Vision 2050, what you find is this stuff. For instance, on here on top, this is about, again, um, you, uh, interfaith things and, and the world religions that should merge into one thing that is unifying all the views into it's it's basically always this no it's it's um getting rid of diversity it's coming up with one system for the planet that covers all the diversity that's it's the synthesis of everything but essentially it's killing diversity so they pretend that it's absorbing all the diversity and bringing everything to everybody but essentially it's killing diversity because it makes a uh, you know, a very bland, uh, superficial notion of, of something that is complex and rich and has a long historical track record. Mm -hmm. As right. It's like we're, we're going we're gonna to help everybody. We're going to help spread diversity by mashing everybody into this global McMonald <laughs> culture. Exactly. It's like and it's, diversity <laughs> means Starbucks on every street corner and McDonald's forever. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's the thing. And, it's, and it's, it's interesting that they try to do this for religion. Right, but that's in the end, the planetary health diet is doing the same thing. No, it's it's just uh, destroying all culinary culture. diversity and, and cultural diversity uh, globally, and and bringing one diet. And then they claim that they're flexible and diverse, and then everybody can adapt and fill in their own. But it's not true. I mean, <laughs> it just ignores. Uh, the actual diversity out there and they want to come up with one diet for the planet with one religion yeah. for the planet with one it's all about unifying things so that everybody can share the same idea and there will be no more frictions no more wars because nobody has opposing views anymore yes yeah. and course, which which is like hg wells had this idea and you read like hg yeah. wells non-fiction books again he's coming right. from the same yes. Place and H.G. Wells was very close with the Huxley family. He was reared by T.H. Huxley, yeah. so he's coming from this idea of the British master race. The British master race is obviously the peak of evolution and at the evolu the tip of the spear of human evolution. And there, uh, they, they are the, uh, the the most highly evolved <laughs> people. Is their assumption, and it's really it's a sickly idea. It's a very it's a very supremacist idea. Um, and 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 H.G. Wells had this. The idea of uh, the, the League of Nations and the United Nations will be used after these great crises. We can create a, you know, from this great dialectical tension, we can create a global society and end war and end poverty and end famine by creating this, you know, global technocratic, scientifically managed culture where everything is controlled, right? And this, it's like the assumption of, you know, the Rockefeller Foundation as well which is uh, laid out very well in Lily E.K.'s book, Caltech, The Rockefeller Foundation and the Rise of the New Biology. She, she, she lays out this idea that um, man's problem is he's not being managed correctly. And all the problems yeah. in the world, all social issues can be corrected by social management. And, and then this extends to biology, right? Well, we need to manage your biology. We need to modify your genes. If you, we just modify your genes and select your breeding partners, uh, then we can like create the perfect world. It's crazy. And it's, it's megalomaniacal and it's, and it's religious at its core. Not just, it's not just economic. Um, it, it is fundamentally a, a religious idea, which I, you know, I keep bringing it back there because I think, uh, as, you, as, you, as you've been saying as well, the, the worldview of these people is what drives their behavior and how they see the world. Yeah, it's very creepy. And, and then Julian Huxley uh, was also in charge of UNESCO. And uh, in the 
post-war years and um, UNESCO tried very hard because at that time it was still fashionable to argue for a, for world government, right? So, so actually centralized world government led by the United Nations, that was not a crazy idea back then. <clears throat> and then they tried to to push that idea to uh, through education. Uh, mm-hmm. But and, and there were some initial experiments already in, in certain schools, for instance, in Los Angeles, I think they tried to, they went a bit too far. And then they bumped into the, the McCarthy <laughs> uh, uh, forces. And then, of course, it had to stop. And then since they became much more careful and, and those proponents went to the backstage. Right. right. But more, um, more of the uh, Fabian socialist approach. Um, yes, uh, exactly. Know, slow yeah. change. Yeah, slow you know what's wild too is UNESCO, uh, the current education minister in Ecuador, where we live, is uh, was a former UNESCO education person. And she's pushing very hard for closing the schools constantly due to this current you know, crisis, which you can't even talk about on YouTube. Uh, But she, you know, we had to keep the schools closed and move towards digital inclusion is the new term, right? So just like the planetary health model, you have the planetary education model that UNESCO has championed. And that includes ubiquitous technological access, which, you know, I'm not saying technology is bad, but um, when you look at the underlying worldview and the the uses of a lot of these technologies, you know, they, they, they are seen as kind of a model for technocratic control, the flow of information. And um, yeah, anyways, UNESCO's model now is moving towards total digital, digital education. Everybody's at home in their smart cities being monitored by their electronic devices and learning remotely, which I don't like. I do not like this idea, but some people it's, do. It's, no, it's an extremely sad perspective. Um, <laughs> But then if you look to the other things here, so this, the, the, I took another, <laughs> some other screenshots. Uh, there's one here saying that we need a coordinating global issues forum uh, so to coordinate all of this. It's got, it will not happen by itself, so it needs some coordination, right? Uh, so a global issues forum, I found that very funny. Um, and then they also say here, uh, one world, people and planet. So it's again about, you know, oneness and everybody is, you know, global citizen and uh, nation should basically not be important anymore. Um, some crazy things here, uh, which I cannot always understand very well. For instance, this is uh, something that uh, should quite likely happen very soon, that we will have 10 to, 50, 10 to 50 million NGOs that will be involved in most public decisions. That's wow. probably That probably uh, suggests that you know the rise in all those NGOs, and, and it's completely it's almost impossible to understand what those NGOs are doing because there's so many of them indeed. Um, so those ones will drive policy. And I think it's just a way around uh, national uh, governments, right? So that the mm. NGOs basically uh, roll out their influence. And, and taxation as well, right? It's kind of like a shell game played by corporations yes, and, yes. and bankers. Yeah, but, and, they, but it's clear that they work with, I mean, the NGOs are becoming incre- increasingly powerful. Uh, the World Economic Forum is an NGO, right? <laughs> yes, it, no, yes, it is. Uh, and then this very creepy one here. Uh, so this, uh, so th- they say that quite likely we'll have a combination of technology and global citizen involvement, and it's, it will lead to the widespread use of millions of eyes and the internet to begin to monitor compliance with climate and sustainability agreements. And, and there's where the creepy. UNESCO's education model also ties yeah. into this of distance learning and of giving iPads to the world for, of course, sustainable sustainability and inclusion and diversity and, you know, stopping. It's also, the, it's also the fact that you have millions of eyes that will monitor compliance. <laughs> this is so mm, creepy. Of course, of course. <laughs> compliance. Well, we we, we got to make sure people are taking their medicines yeah. to make sure they don't get yes. too much testosterone. and. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, so it sounds like a bizarre, joke, but it, you know, it's, there's a grain all, of truth. All these bizarre things are, are coming from WBCSD, and and and, and again, that's it's a very boring organization. You see here uh, the president Peter Bucker, which is also on the advisory board of the Eat Foundation, and is very is, they're working closely together. I mean, WBCSD and Eat are, are um, allies in in many ways. Mm. Right. Okay. <laughs> we go on. <laughs> hey, there's our friend Klaus Schwab. Yeah. Hey, yeah. yeah so this is um, the philanthropists. This is a well, was also a, a, yeah, well, 
shocking event, basically. I mean, it was shocking to me. <laughs> um, in June 2019, the World Economic Forum and the United Nations signed a strategic partnership, which means that the World Economic Forum will be a formal partner of the United Nations so that the sustainable development goals can be implemented and achieved. I mean, the World Economic Forum representing those companies, those global corporations that caused you know, environmental devastation in the first place, they are going to be the ones that are going to help the United Nations now to to um, mm. make it clean and... and uh, yeah, and, BP and, and Shell and Monsanto yeah, exactly. and Bayer <laughs> are going to, they're going to fix the world. Yeah. They're going to help you be sustainable by consuming the product. No, and then you, you have the Secretary General with a big smile, <laughs> happy to mm. have signed this contract. Yeah, it's, it looks so goofy. Look at that guy. He looks. <laughs> he really is like. He looks like seventy IQ level in that picture. Um, Gutierrez. It's. I mean, it's. And and then people don't talk about this enough. I think this should be. This should be at the center of all discussions. The fact that the World Economic Forum, the United Nations, have signed a strategic partnership. I mean, this is. Well, anyway. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, we're we're supposed to be. You know, these are our elected officials and, uh, you know, they, they have these meetings openly now. It used to be a little bit more underground, a little more secret, like with <laughs> Bilderberg, who, you know, Klaus Schwab was involved with Bilderberg as well. And Klaus Schwab, who was trained by Henry Kissinger, um, right? And you can look at the photos of Schwab with Kissinger in the 1970s. Um, that was Andy the, Okay. These are literal, 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 literal war criminals, protégés are... Uh, are, are out here setting policy at a global level without our input, but it's okay because they have their cute little rainbow medallion images <laughs> that make you feel nice, and they they, they 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 make a green logo, and and it's supposed to be good for the planet. So then the World Economic Forum, and then this brings us back to the you know the start of our conversation. The World Economic Forum is also very much in favor of the planetary health diet. So this is on their website. Why we we all need to go. It's not. It's not maybe this is an idea to consider. No, we all need to go on the planetary health diet to save the world, <laughs> nothing less. Um, and that happened just after the publication of the Atlantic report. And then the World Economic Forum was very instrumental in uh, the early stages of the Food System Summit. And the Food System Summit has been something that also has been uh, discussed uh, much and. Um, mm came with lots of controversies. And the Rockefeller Foundation putting a lot of money into these ideas as well. Uh, Rockefeller Foundation was instrumental in bringing about the GMO revolution, which resulted in the patenting of life and you know, the further consolidation of the food supply and the food chain being consolidated in the hands of very few corporations. Those very corporations now are telling us, oh, we're going to save the planet, right? They're creating giant dead zones in the, in the ocean through their use of these pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers. They're creating monocrop uh, disasters and, and pushing rural people out of existence. But no, they're philanthropists and they just they want to save the planet. And it's and you know I, I I try to be very careful with the Rockefellers because I know it's tied to many conspiracy theories and I try to avoid conspiracy uh, even though mm. you know I have to talk about higher organizations with big plans but I was careful about not mentioning the Rockefellers too much because but oh sorry I I blew them. it I keep telling I keep saying Rockefeller Foundation <laughs> no but I mean <laughs> came to the same conclusion you just always bump into them I mean it's unavoidable they're just all over the place and they've been all over the place since the early days. So, yeah, that's why I like Lily E. K.'s book because that's from she was an MIT scientist and Lily E. K. Dr. Lily E. K. Caltech, the Rockefeller Foundation of the Rise of the New Biology. This is a you know, this is published through MIT and it it, yeah. it is mapping out the ideas of you know eugenics and the transformation of man and this new the new man and transhumanism uh, and, and even genetic modification of uh, organisms including human beings. And uh, she, this is not just some kook conspiracy theorist. Mm -hmm. She was, you know, legitimate scientist. So yeah, I think but, but we don't want to just create create these crazy theories. Like we want to be able to document these um, uh, claims that we make. And, and we've seen it before with a couple of Rockefellers that I showed. They're they're completely into the most crazy ideas. <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, just a matter of looking hmm. at it. Uh, hmm. And then in the end, of course, we know that the, the Rockefeller United Nations. Uh, 
you know, relationship is, is going back a long time as well. I mean, the, the money they threw at the United Nations was enormous in the first place. Uh, mm, they donated the land that the United Nations yeah, building New York sits headquarters, on. Yes. Um, so let, let's look at something. Now, the, the, the difficulty here, if you investigate this topic, is that you'll find so many different uh, um, organizations and NGOs and think tanks, and it's it's a jungle, really. And But... If you dig, you'll always find the same players. Uh, sometimes this one is missing or this one is missing, but in the end, you know, they, they're very repetitive. They, they just create many of them. Um, and that's why I, I often use this one to illustrate uh, my points, uh, because this one is one of the most comprehensive ones where you find most of them together in one platform. And it's called the Global Commons Alliance. And the Global Commons Alliance has a plan for the planet. Before it was in the early days, I mean, the early stages of the initiative, it was called a big plan for the small planet. Now it's just a plan for the planet. But you, you get the point. So they have a plan for the planet and uh, we, better, we, we better listen because they are the powerful people. Uh, at the bottom, you see the World Economic Forum, right? This little square here, the World Economic Forum. And, uh, and that's uh, translated... Uh, into various public-private partnerships. Uh, for instance, here you have the Capitals Coalition and Ceres and, and various others. Uh, I'll just zoom in into uh, here to the Natural Capital Coalition and, and Ceres because I want to show that within those public-private partnerships, you'll find many... Uh, so, first of all, lots of corporations, and you see Shell is here, for instance, and uh, if Coca-Cola company... Uh, and various public-private partnerships within the public-private partnerships, uh, and it, it goes on forever. Um, but you'll find lots of uh, food multinationals as well, food corporations, or, or big agro-food corporations, also fertilizer companies, and um, and so forth. Um, yeah, very green, very sustainable, all the big GMO <laughs> yes, companies, all the big ultra <laughs> I mean, look at this. I mean, Natural Capital Coalition, and then it's, so it's all about reaching the SDGs, and those are the ones that are going to, to take care yeah. of it. The SDGs being <laughs> the Sustainable Coalition. Development Goals as laid out in the you know, Agenda 21 documents from, uh, was it 1992? They, they started, it was 17 Sustainable Development Goals, and they all sound great, right? It's like, it's, it's like oh, healthcare for all, uh, you know, equality, and we're going to yeah. feed the world. How can you begin that, right? <laughs> yeah, you, well, you don't want to end poverty. I mean, it was the same thing that the Bolsheviks said. You don't want, you don't want to end, you don't want to end inequality. Um, yeah. You know, unfortunately, ending poverty and inequality has usually resulted in, you know, these utopias very often end up, they always end up with just genocide, which is <laughs> very strange. I'm not saying that this is like a genocide. Ha well, I, mean, I guess the argument could be made, but, uh, you know, you look at the results of the Bolshevism, Hitlerism, these, these utopian ideals. Well, they always need to kill off a big portion of the population. The French revolutionaries, too. They were like, you know, a lot of them had this idea. If you kill off 50 percent of the population, we'll have bread for everybody. <laughs> you just got to kill half the people. The Ooh. thing is, historically speaking, if you if you give power to, to a small committee of central planners, you always run into trouble and it's always... Uh, ending in pure horror. So, so what Sadly. do we expect from this? Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have Ceres here. You find all the big food. I mean, a, a couple of very big food multinationals. Uh, you see them here. You also find Impossible Foods, by the way. Very interesting. Um, and so, so I want to say that the food corporations are present, right? So, the, so the big producers of ultra processed foods um, uh, are present in the Global Commons Alliance. So they are going to help us to achieve healthy and sustainable diets together with the World Economic mm. Forum. Whether okay. we like it or not. <laughs> yes. <laughs> help us. Uh, WBCSD is there as well. Uh, and WBCSD uh, represents various types of corporations, but they also represent, of course, agro-food uh, companies, and you see them on this slide. Um, and WBCSD and the EAT Foundation have a formal partnership, which is called FRESH, FRESH Initiative. Uh, and so, again, we have those companies here that will help us to, you know, go towards the planetary health diet. Yeah, Google, Bayer, Kellogg's, <laughs> Pepsi, yeah, Syngenta, yeah. Bayer. Yeah, uh, is, like, what is this? This is crazy. <laughs> yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's so absurd that you, you can hardly believe that it's true, right? But this is, you can look it up. This is 
this is actually the, the the fresh initiative. So so those companies listed here are the ones that are going to provide us with healthy and sustainable diets. Uh, and uh, it's um, obvious also that those companies listed before are very much interested in the so-called plant-based transition. And whatever is uh, imitation food, um, they love it. Um, and all of them, I mean, you look at, at uh, PepsiCo or you look at Kellogg or you look at, just look at all of them and they all have a plant-based uh, portfolio. Uh, the CEO of Nestle goes as far as saying that he wants that Americans eat less meat. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So, And then here, this is Hanukkah Faber from Unilever and she says that we need to fundamentally change the entire food system and they have to, we have to press reset. You know. The reset language is there, and then, of course, what this implies is that well, we shouldn't have the the the, the, the traditional um, Magnum ice cream. We should have the vegan ice cream instead. Oh, it's that'll make it better if it's just yes. plant based. Yes. And what do you know? That also makes it more profitable, right? Exactly. Because you can cut out the middleman of the you know because. Look, most of the ranches, uh, most of the cattle are actually still grown by ranchers, right? So the processing facility in the United States, at least, the processing facilities that are kind of consolidated. Um, and so th their idea to the solution to the problem that their companies have exacerbated and uh, I would argue created with their high profit, high yield, and you know they, they market it to farmers as um, sustainable and as what do you, uh, as um, uh, efficient, right? In the name of efficiency, they've created this chemical-based agricultural system that's resulted in the destruction of rural peoples, right? And the and, and, and mass migration into urban areas, and their solution is not uh, is more of the same. Right now, I would say, I would argue that this, and we've been arguing this for years, the, the, the actual solution to our food crisis, to much of our health crisis is locally produced quality foods, right? From both animal and plant sources. But if we're going to have protein and fat sources produced locally, that can only be done through animals. That can only be done. Like, there's no, the only way you're going to feed your family on your own land or locally is going to be using animal input and, you know, properly managed livestock using uh, what's come now to be known as like regenerative agriculture techniques. This is an actual solution to the destruction of our soil. Uh, this is an actual solution to the, uh, you know, the, 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 the poisoning of our water. You can build uh, up giant carbon stores in the ground. You can actually deposit more carbon in the ground using properly, uh, properly grazed ruminant animals. And I would say that is a viable solution, but they don't want to go towards that. They don't even want to talk about that. They want to tell us, yeah, processed foods, more ultra processed foods rather, because, you know, they call meat, they call ground beef a processed food, right? Yeah. Um, they want more of the same. Yeah. And, and then, well, of course, I mean, meat is not interesting to those companies, but meat cannot be ultra processed. You can, well, you can make, uh, you know, sorts of, you know, kind of nuggets and stuff like that. But that's not what those co companies are interested well, in. Well, lab-grown meat, though. Lab-grown meat, that's sustainable, right? If we can grow it in a lab, then how, how, how can... It's, it's, so, it's so backwards. <laughs> okay, let's go on. Uh, then another player here is WWF. So this is published on... So it's, again, it's all interconnected, right? I'll show you. This slide already shows how interconnected things are. This is uh, published on WBCSD's website. And it's referring to a report by WWF. And it's a report written by uh, the former uh, global food lead scientist. Well, sorry, it's the former director of science translation of EAT. So it's it's like all the, diff the different players here in, on, one, on one page. And this report from WWF is uh, arguing that we should be eating planet-based diets. And if you see the E is, is colored in a different way, so it's basically plant-based diets. And they propose a, uh, a range of, of policy options to bring us there. And it ranges from doing nothing, <laughs> which is the soft level, to eliminating choice, which is the hard way of intervening. And then they make the argument that, well, we're all the time talking about things and we're too soft and we should be harder. <laughs> so they want to move it all the way up to restricting choice or eliminating choice. And, um, and because otherwise people will not change. 
And so, so have a look at this. So soft to hard. And then have a look at this. This is from the uh, World Resources Institute, which is again a very uh, close ally of, of the EAT Foundation, and they do exactly the same thing. They say, well, we have a, a range of different interventions, the soft interventions, and that's, uh, you know, nudging and things like that. And then you have the hide intervention, the hard interventions, which is about banning, removing meat from restaurants, uh, taxing uh, meat uh, so that it becomes much more expensive. Uh, and then the in-between ones, uh, like uh, veganery type of things, or, or working through dietary guidelines and putting front of back labeling uh, to um, to modify behavior in supermarkets. And they have also uh, applied something called the shift wheel to um, to bring us there, because the shift wheel is a is a classical technique in marketing that they uh, apply here to the transition. Uh, of, of diets and within that shift wheel you'll find things like disguising the change so it shouldn't be too obvious you should do it carefully that people don't notice it um, you should make some food socially unacceptable whereas you make others socially acceptable uh, you should constrain display of the ones that you you know so you you interfere with how things are displayed and, and promoted um, and then if you talk about uh, names you shouldn't call uh, a vegan sausage a vegan sausage you should call it uh, well, what did we have? A garden breakfast sausage or something, or mm, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Beyond sausage. Veggie sausage and mash. So, so there's a whole there's, there's a whole think tank behind it. They, 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 they pump lots of budgets into coming up with all kinds of strategies to to make people change and switch their diets. But it's interesting to see. So we have this uh, the, the call for hard policy interventions. That's that's prominent within all those players. Um, we talked about the World Resources Institute before. We had, we have because the World Resources Institute is is often seen and perceived as a, a, a scientific think tank that is uh, looking at how to model our resources in the best way, so we can, you know, it's to the benefit of everybody. It's a, but essentially. The whole institute is controlled by bankers. <laughs> I mean, if you look at the board of directors, this is the kind of people you find. Now, Andrew Steer, which was a CEO, has left. He went to Bezos Earth Fund. <laughs> anyway, uh, but he was a banker as well. He was a trustee for the World Economic Forum, a former World Bank functionaire. He advised the Bank of America and, and so on. Uh, and then all the, the other philanthropist, are... I think, would be the proper way. <laughs> yeah, philanthropist, the philanthropist. Yeah, that's how you call them. <laughs> uh, and then uh, the others as well, you know, Goldman Sachs, Council on Foreign Relations, World Economic Forum, uh, GP Morgan. Uh, those are the people that are basically in control of the World Resources Institute. Mm -hmm. But that brings you a different perspective. And then what's interesting is that uh, the two people at the bottom are, are so them, there are other ones, but also, you know, one of the more. <laughs> of the most striking uh, biographies here. But the two people at the bottom are very interesting as such as well. David Blood is um, a partner of Al Gore, which gives you blood and gore. Uh, <laughs> and uh, blood and gore are uh, have financial interest in Beyond Meat through their uh, generation investment management and Kleiner Perkins, where Al Gore is connected to as well. So there, there's... Those investment portfolios are, are, are very heavily also leaning towards the, the plant-based transitions. And then Christiane Figueres is, uh, she's, she's not just anybody, she's the ex-executive secretary of the UNFCCC. So she, she's basically the person that uh, um, orchestrated the Paris agreements. So she was high up uh, in, in the organization and she was, you know, organizing the Paris convention and, um, and she is... At the same time, also um, on the board of Unilever, but she's also on the board now of Impossible Foods, uh, and she has said some remarkable things. One of the things she said is that in in a, in a decade or so, uh, we should treat carnivores like we're treating smokers, and they should not be allowed in restaurants anymore. So that's the kind of, <laughs> that's the kind of person she is. Um, it's funny because that idea, I mean, it would have sounded so strange a few years ago, but now we're seeing that. You know, rolled out in many countries of the world where if you don't uh, accept certain products, right, or endorse certain products and put them in your body, you can't go to restaurants, right? Now, there, again, this is the door. This is opening the door to this social credit type system where this is completely 
realistic to think that this could be done, right? We're talking about digital gateways, QR code requirements for entry points at all restaurants for travel and whatnot. And any behavior uh, can, you know, be used to score you socially, right? And this idea also of like your internet search history can be used to determine your credit score, all right, the, the the social credit system that's already been gamed and uh, and already been tested and implemented in China, uh, and, and of course big tech and Google, who are members of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and uh, working towards these ideas with the World Resources Institute and whatnot, that they that Google has helped China to develop these systems of social control and management of people. Well, if sure, if if you would let this kind of people. Um, have it their way they will they would connect it to carbon footprints that's clear and then, then meat would be mm. like would, would just deplete all your credits <laughs> yeah and the but, carbon footprints the way that these are calculated it's all this like weird social yeah. algorithm it's it's like you know this it's like it's like spiritual uh calculus being it, it's it's very it's very unscientific and the models that they use are are, are highly suspect and, and, and sketchy Another thing is that she is the sister of Jose Maria Figueres Olsen, which is uh, a former president of Costa Rica. And, and their father was also a, a triple president of Costa Rica before. <laughs> so they're high up in, in Costa Rican uh, politics. And interestingly, Jose Maria was supposed to be the, follow, the, the, the successor to Klaus Schwab. He was supposed to, to be the next Klaus Schwab. He was the CEO at the time in 2003. He became CEO of the World Economic Forum. Uh, but then he got involved into, into some scandal with undeclared consultancy fees for a French uh, uh, company, and he had to step down. Uh, but he, this brings you, uh, you know, very obvious link with the World Economic Forum as well. You see, by the way, that here on his... Uh, um, here listed on the uh, this is from the website of the of the Eat Foundation, by the way. So they're also close to the Eat Foundation, and again, everything is somehow interrelated. And so, no wonder that the World Economic Forum, uh, here retweeted by the founder of Eat, came up with a tweet uh, in favor of the fact that we should tax meat eaters like smokers. And now you have again the meat eating smoking connection. So they're all supportive of their own ideas and they all find it a good idea to stigmatize meat eaters and just you know, uh, put pressure on them. And so you could talk about all the little blocks. I will not cover them all, but I'll just cover the most interesting ones. The next ones I'm going to look at here uh, are the following. So there's a couple of different players. I talked about the Potsdam Institute before um, and, and, and various others. They are the ones that have um, uh, convened or, or, or set up something called the, the, the Food and Land Use Coalition. And within the Food and Land Use Coalition, you have the FABLE program. And the FABLE program has the intention to... Uh, shift diets worldwide towards the planetary health diet. Um, so it, it's it's you see it here from the website. It uses the Eat Lancet dietary guidelines and the planetary boundaries to develop global and national science-based targets and pathways towards them. Now this is the pathway for Australia, uh, and this is where it should land in 2050. The Eat Lancet standard, and that would imply a 90% reduction in red meat for Australians. And interesting, there's a lot can, of beef produced. Like they produce a yeah. lot of beef. But that's the, the thing is, they can, they can still produce their beef, but they cannot eat it. They have to export mm. it. Right? Okay. Yeah. Well. Uh, yeah. You, how's China going to get all their beef? <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> and how are the Americans who you know? I mean, the American ranchers who are being driven off their land. How are they going to be able to eat meat? <laughs> yeah. So the Australians Silly. are expected to <laughs> to reduce their meat uh, intake by ninety percent uh, in the next decades. That will land well. Um, so and and they have prioritized certain areas in the world to start. So they talk about starting with Colombia, Indonesia, and Ethiopia, and in a later stage, would, they would also include the Nordics, the Nordic countries in Europe, uh, Australia, and and uh, and the rest of Europe. 
And now you, they have the first initiatives running now in, in Colombia, and Indonesia, and Ethiopia, because I think probably because they have some befriended politicians there. I'm not sure. Um, C40 Cities, oh, that's a great one. C40 Cities uh -huh. uh, is, is another private, public private partnership thing with lots of different players and, you know, very important players involved. Um, and within the C40 Cities program, there's also a dietary part. Uh, and, and the C40 it, Cities is like smart cities, right? It's smart well, city yes, initiative. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. Yes, it's all about making sustainable cities, but it's basically make, yeah, come in, indeed. Well, di digital inclusion, and this is the idea that you mentioned earlier, was it like 50 million eyes, right? It's, you know, constant yeah. monitoring through... Yeah. Uh, telecommunications tracking, networks, yeah. mm -hmm. yes, everything yes. tracked, traced, controlled, quantified, yeah. and scored in a social credit style system. This is what the smart cities are, are about. Yeah. So, so basically, whenever you hear the word smart, something is wrong. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> Unfortunately. Smart, <laughs> right. I mean, it's just like green, right? Or sustainable. It's like, yeah, okay, that sounds cool. No, yes. what you really mean by smart, what you really mean by sustainable, what you really mean by green, it's not what on the surface one would expect unfortunately <laughs> no. um so the program for some of their cities uh, and it's, it's a total of 14 cities and uh, big cities right we're talking about barcelona we're talking about london los angeles milan paris uh, tokyo toronto um so those the mayors of those cities have pledged that they will achieve the planetary health diet for all of their citizens by 2030 Okay, so within the within the cities, within their policy, uh, they will implement planetary health diet standards, which implies that by 2030, according to their progressive target, you can still eat 16 kilograms of meat per person per year, and that isn't really not much. You can you know calculate it; it's not a lot, uh, and 90 kilograms of dairy, um, and in their ambitious target, it would mean zero meat and zero dairy. So this is a serious document, right? So these are the mayors of global cities that have signed this agreement that implies that the ambitious target is to avoid meat and dairy in their city policies. Mm. And this is why you see them right you know, is, removing meat from children's menus in some of these cities where malnutrition is already a problem, uh, where they're already stunted, uh, whether, you know, you already have you know, stunting, was it like 20% of children worldwide have have their growth stunted due to malnutrition? Well, it's you know, in, in places like India, it goes up to 40% in, in, in zero to five-year-olds. Oh, but so it's okay it's, because that's sustainable because they're already on a plant-based diet in India where the diabetes rates and cancer rates and life expectancy are all, you know, worse than the world. And and, and actually, EAT has, EAT, EAT has uh, in one of its documents, it has stated that India and Indonesia are the models for sustainable eating. <laughs> like, so they say that India and Indonesia are really the, the only countries that are matching the, the you know. The, <laughs> wow. And, they, and again, I mean, I'm not just making up the statistic, like the diabetes rates, the life expectancy in India, the obesity rates are, are like the worst in the world. <laughs> That's crazy. And these are some examples. So this is from C40 Cities. Uh, this is this is from the World Economic Forum, right? So this is a screenshot from the World Economic from the World Economic Forum video. The World Economic Forum videos are fantastic. I mean, every week you'll find something hilarious. Yeah, some new dystopian idea for yeah, NSU as oh, you, think it's you guys will just no, it's actually <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like uh, there's there one that was recently re circulating. It was from 2018. And it was like, oh, look at these refugees in these smart cities. They're all being managed by blockchain, and they're ret they're getting retina scans so that they can receive their food rations. But it's a, it's it's cool. It's sustainable. It's helpful because they're refugees. It's just like it's mad. It's madness. So this is this is uh, referring to uh, the the policies in in Milan. I told you that Milan is a global is one of those global cities. Uh, the mayor of Milan is on the uh, advisory board of Eat, by the way. So no coincidence there. So the, so it's about you know taking beef out of the of the ragu, uh, you know the pasta sauce. Oh, sorry, uh, and replacing it with soy. Um, and then this is from London, uh, where they say that we will align our food procurement to the planetary health diet. Uh, and the, the mayor will ban unhealthy foods. You know, you have to know that in the Atlantic report, they black on white explicitly state that red meat is an unhealthy food. 
and they put it in the same sentence with sugar. Right? So, so sugar and red meat are unhealthy foods. That's how they specifically state uh, stated in their in their um, in their report. So, unhealthy foods here means uh, red meat, among other things. Doesn't it? What, what a coincidence that all the unhealthy foods are the foods that can be produced locally by small family farms, and all the sustainable foods that they, that they say are sustainable are foods that come from factories and that are very profitable and also, unfortunately, very low in nutritional value, bioavailability, um, and you know, very, very low quality protein sources. That, that brings me perfectly to the next <laughs> to the next slide <laughs> so uh, in was it 2018 yes 2018 the united nations environment program unip you remember morris strong's mm. uh, child uh, awarded its highest environmental distinction so the highest environmental distinction they have the champions of the earth award to uh, beyond meat and impossible foods <laughs> so so what they did here is that so unip de facto um, gave its highest environmental award to two producers of foods that belong in the in, in, in the junk food culture, you know, because this is about burgers and sausages and so I mean it's not even burgers and sausages, it's you know, it's it's imitation foods. That's already remarkable. Um, and then not only that, both companies have openly declared that their ambition is not only just to offer an extra choice on the market, their ambition is to destroy livestock agriculture. And they want to do that in the next two decades. And they, they openly declare that. I mean, their goal is to abolish, to destroy livestock agriculture. And again, this is this is this is warfare. Like this, you want to yes. destroy livestock agriculture. You you are saying you want to destroy rural people. You are saying you want to remove my way of life from existence, right? Like this is this is something. This is not just oh yeah, you 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 bigots don't yeah. want to eat bugs instead of meat. No, no. This is you're you're. They've literally declared war on small family farms. They have declared war on small agriculture and on uh, on the most nutritious source of food that uh, that that is that is crucial for developing children. Right? You need protein. You need fat. They're essential amino acids, essential fatty acids. You get all those in the most bioavailable, easily digestible form from animal foods and you can produce those locally. These people say, no, that's bad, it's bad for the planet. We're just gonna, we're just gonna get rid of all you. We want, we want to genocide your way of life and remove you from the food chain. <laughs> and this is, this is war. Yeah, it's not about giving another option or, or, or you know, expanding choice. It's about replacing. Um, and and in, the in one of the tweets of UNEP, uh, they talk about mainstreaming meatless burgers. So solving the, the whole sustainable diets thing will be through offering meatless burgers. That's the, that's that's their view on it. I mean, it's, that's genius, no? Let's, Burgerless burgers. Let's, just meatless it. burgers for the planet and everything will be fixed. And, and as, as if burgers, I mean, when you look at how people eat in most of the world, right? Not the world, not the, mo not the people that are being marketed these decadent, um, you know, trendy foods like Beyond Meat and Impossible uh, Meat. The, most of the world are consuming nose to tail, the whole animal, Right, so here in Ecuador, some of the most valuable pieces of meat are like tongue, kidney, mm -hmm. liver. These provide nutrients that you're not going to find in the same quality. Vitamin A, for instance, which is required for development of the human nervous system, uh, very high levels of vitamin A. In fact, the most vitamin A is in uh, you know liver of ruminant animals and of you know pigs as well, and that is very prized in most of the world, which these people call the developing world, which yes. means the world that is not yet completely corporately controlled from, you know, farm to table or, you know, what do you call it? Farm to fork, which is another one of these marketing terms that they're using. Um, most of the developing world, the third world, they eat, they require, uh, or they, they're dependent on animal foods and they prize parts of the animal that is not in burgers, that's not in uh, sausages, right? So it's, it, it's just, it's very strange that this idea of like, if you could just replace burgers well, you're going to save the planet. Most of the world's not eating burgers. Most of the world's eating, uh, they're eating tripe. They're eating um, kidney, liver, tongue, lengua. You know, like Mexicans love lengua. They make tacos with lengua. Um, and yeah, you're, you're going to make that in a lab. You're not going to replace that with soy. We're talking about sources of iodine, heme iron, um, uh, vitamin A in its retinol form, fat soluble vitamins, vitamin K2, vitamin D, these come from animal foods. You're not going to get this from your Beyond Burger. 
So it's this reductionist attitude, but also they don't, they're just reducing it to, oh, if we can just replace it and make it taste like the real thing, then we're going to save the planet. They're not considering the nutritional deficiencies that they're going to be promoting through this. And, um, and, and, you know, yeah. there's a reason why they focus on burgers and those, they're producing burgers and sausages and nuggets. You know, and that the reason is because they cannot imitate anything else. I mean, it's way too difficult. The only thing they can make is something that you can uh, you can hide it in in a sandwich or a bun. You you can mm. cover it with sauces so you don't taste it. Uh, because if you taste it without all the condiments, it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So pe people up in the hills, people in the hills in Colombia, uh, South America, the Bolivians are not eating burgers, right? They're eating. They're eating uh, guinea. They're eating cooey. They they have guinea yeah. pigs that they raise that they feed grass. But no, those are bad. They create methane, and methane is destroying the planet. We got to get rid of your livestock that you raise by just feeding grass on your own land. Get rid of your guinea pigs. We got to get rid of your cows. But we'll give you the Bill Gates Beyond Burger. But don't worry, it's got GMO uh, leg hemoglobin. Or no, that's impossible, right? GMO leg hemoglobin that uh, that that supposedly mimics the the taste of of real meat um, it's made of gmo soy and it's all patented and then and then you wonder uh, how on earth is is unip you know putting that on a pedestal how, <laughs> what is driving them to do so and and to make matters worse this is coming from the unip website as well uh where they call meat the world's most urgent problem so is, is it, they don't even mention fossil fuels. No, it's meat is the world's most. This is literally on the website of UNIP. And all, all the while, like people are being thrown into poverty uh, through this, you know, the economic warfare that's happening globally. People are, you know, children are starving and are malnourished. But no, it's the fact that people eat meat yeah. that's yeah. that's bad. It's know? not but the like what, and, the, and the BPs that they, <laughs> we see on this, you know, in, in this cluster. No, it's meat is the, no. the issue here. And, and thirty percent of childbearing age women are uh, anemic in the world. But you know, the best source of bioavailable heme iron—that's so bad for the planet. We got to get rid of that. Like it's backwards. You know, be, just to, uh, to interrupt with a quick, quick shout out to our sponsor. Uh, you guys who are watching, you guys sponsor this show. You guys donations. Thank you so much for the generous donation. We got a nice generous donation from Damien Scarborough. Thank you so much, man. Through a big old fat super chat. It's the first super chat we've gotten through Streamlabs in well, almost a month. Almost a month. So it's been a long break. I haven't put out any videos for a couple weeks. Thank you guys who support these streams. Support this channel by sharing the videos, right? By liking the videos and doing that. And, and also, thank you to, for those who support us through them donations like Damien over there and like the people dropping tips over there on um, on Rockfin. Big shout out to ELC who says, these people all start from the presupposition that man is a cancer on the earth and the science is made to fit that. I, I agree with that statement. I mean, it's a what a, what a sick way to see human beings, right? Um, human beings are beautiful. I mean, I believe m m man is made in the image and likeness of God. These people think that human beings are just a terrible scourge on the earth. We don't agree with that fundamental sub presupposition. So thank you very much. Jethro, thank you for the donation. Honky Kong says, you guys are both uber in my book. Thanks for the fascinating and terrifying afternoon of globalist revelation. Thank you very much uh, for that $10 tip over there. Jacob, thank you for the tip. Um, and a big shout out to the sponsor. We got, we got Chalk, Chalk.com, C-H-O-Q.com, right? You can support yourself. You can support your own health, right? You can build up your own health. And also, um, you know, it, well, let's see, we got, we got a, we got a coupon code here. Let me just pull up the coupon code Chalk.com, C-H-O-Q.com, highest quality natural adaptogens. I love the Chalk daily, the Tong Cat Ali extract, right? These are all wild crafted. 100% organic, beyond organic, many of these ingredients. And you can get 50% off on the highest quality adaptogens, natural supplements over at chalk.com if you use the coupon code BIG50. Now, if you use that, it'll also be 50% more uh, toxic masculinity for your, yourself. Also, 50% more climate change if you use that. The, the, the climate will change to be 50% better if you use the coupon code BIG50, get 50% off store-wide, choq.com. Uh, Chalk.com over there helping to, helping to fight Big Soy. They're a good family-owned company, uh, and they support our stream, and you can support your health and support your own body uh, and support the work that we do here by going over there to chalk.com. There's a link in the description, choq.com. Use big50 at checkout, 50% off store 
worldwide. And um, yeah, thank you guys for for the patience there and for the support. Um, back back to our guest here, Dr. Frederick Leroy. Um, again, really appreciate you coming on and helping to lay out the uh, your research you've done here. I love the uh, the infographics you've come up with. Okay, just a quick question for my own curiosity. I think I asked you this before. Do you what program do you use? Do you use any specific program to make these like uh, PowerPoint um, displays? No, just PowerPoint. <laughs> just PowerPoint. Yeah, it just seems like I don't know. It seems it it must take a lot of time to make some of these uh, these, these graphics. I yeah, they'll make them in one. So you know, they they build up over over time. Yeah. Whenever yeah, I find you, something interesting, I'll just collect it and I'll try to insert it in the right position. <laughs> I love it because it, and then it gives you you're cognitively mapping the ideas, and then when you're talking about these, it helps to give structure to it and and to visualize. I uh, yeah. I'm, I, I, I'm envious of your, your organizational skills here. You've done such a good job at presenting this in a great manner. Um, yeah, anyways, sorry for the interruption there, Dr. Leroy. Got to shout out my sponsors. Back to the, uh, back to the, the world's most urgent problem, which is clearly <laughs> people are not eating enough Beyond Burgers in uh, you know, rural areas of India. Right. And, well, it's it just so incredibly... You know, unscientific. <laughs> the whole slide here is so unscientific and so completely detached from reality. And then it is coming from UNEP. <laughs> okay, it's an organization that we need to take seriously because it's supposed to guide us towards a sustainable planet. It's well. Um, a small word on 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 PIK. So I told you that PIK uh, was founded by Sheldon Huber who was involved with WBGU. And uh, this is uh, the organization that at the same time of the Davos Great Transformation Agenda came out with a publication called The Great Transformation. And it's a, <clears throat> it's, um, a cartoon. And in the book, of course, they make also the case against meat. And it's about this one, for instance, is about uh, uh, so according to United Nations nutrition expert, the term insects should therefore also be eaten in the industrialized nations because and so forth. And so, forth. so this is a promotion of insects and anything basically that will take us away from meat will do. Uh, and then back to the Rockefellers. Uh, this is one of your favorites, I guess, Tristan. Oh, yeah. Uh, population, population in the American future. future. There we go. <laughs> so this is this is an interesting, uh, uh, you know, paragraph because it already shows. It's, it's, it, this is from 69, if I'm not mistaken. I think it's 69, right? Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. The, Rock, the Rockefeller po uh, Population Council Report. Yeah. This was, you know, you, this was Richard Nixon, uh, Richard, Richard yes. Nixon's administration commissioned this right. and it was published in 69. 69. Okay, so that's that's the period of the Club of Rome and, and limits to growth and, uh, uh, you know, the Stockholm Conference is also around those years. So this is, you know, lots of things are set into motion. Um, and we, we already see the exact same thing that we're facing today. I mean, what, what they were talking about is what they're trying to implement now. Uh, because they were saying that we should, so this is from the report, maybe let's have a closer look at it. So what they say is that the population could avoid the price rise by shifting away from consumption of animal livestock towards vegetables and synthetic meats. There you have it. They were talking about yeah. synthetic meats already back then. And perhaps it would shift to a closed system of agriculture, food from factories. So they're promoting the food from factories, lab yeah. meat, right? Yep. That's it. And then it's funny to see that they also understand that the population will not necessarily appreciate it. So we should select the solutions that the population will dislike least. <laughs> hmm. uh, well, and then later and, in the same report, they talk about, well, we can influence what the population likes by simply manipulating their media and their television yes. shows and their radio shows yes. that you know, yes. basically brainwash them into doing what we want. So, so it's, all, it's always about social engineering. That's what it's always about. Yes. And, um, and, and they also say that uh, some group should be assigned central responsibility here. Uh, and it should be a lobby for the future. Remember the one on the WBCSD slide where they were, they were talking about the, the global policy forum or something. You see, mm -hmm. it always comes down to a, to a centralized group of people that should you know, take the responsibility, plan it, implement it, uh, mm. 
And it's, it's yeah, the, the ascended the, masters correct. of industry, right? The, 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 the great white brotherhood of Blavatsky, but kind of uh, concretized and, uh, in, and, and manifested as the industrial magnates who are just so enlightened, right? Yeah. This is uh, more recent. This is so they've, since they've been, uh, they've been involved in, in, in many different fields, in many different areas, <clears throat> but also, of course, the dietary. Uh, dietary uh, plans for for well, change 50 then... years later right reset the table 50 years later and in the yeah. meantime like since the rockefeller population council report first came out and again this uh was a population in the american future the rockefeller uh rockefeller population council report was it it, it was the assumption of this is always there are too many people how yeah. are we going to reduce human population and manage resources uh, and it's like this Malthusian kind of eugenics um, assumed uh, position that we need to decrease human population and 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 social engineer people. Oh, it's, it's absolutely Malthusian because this is not even about climate change. It has nothing to do with climate change. What you see here, mm -hmm. they were not arguing for synthetic meats and food from factories and so on because of climate change. They were, it was pure about resources. It was resource yeah. populations and resources. It didn't have anything to do with, with climate change at, at that stage. It just right. it, they use any argument just to this is the goal, right? It's it's controlled production of foods, standardized, uh, planned, centralized. That's the aim. Now mm -hmm. the, the reason to get to go there doesn't matter all that much if it's climate change or resources or I mean, as long as we get there. Right, right. Well, in the same report, they talk about, you know, there's a quote from them, we recognize that in opening a discussion of the family, we tread on sacred ground for the family is our most revered institution. They're like, well, how can we manipulate and change your vision of what it is to be a, a, a healthy family? Right. So it's like, it, and they, they talk about, you know, government and state run and state mandated child care. Right. They, 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 they talk about these as ways to reduce the population and to break up families. I mean, this is not just crazy conspiracy talk this is the rockefeller po population council report discussing engineering and changing how people see themselves in the family unit in order to decrease population and they talk about moving people into urban areas and cities and they say well this is good and uh and, and if we and, and um we, we want to influence they say they want to influence in this document they say we will influence a exodus from the rural areas and destroy rural populations and move them into managed urban centers of course the c40 cities the smart cities are what we see now so these aren't just um you know crazy kooky they are, they are crazy kooky ideas um but they uh there's big money behind this and and long-term planning goes into this yeah you see that you see that everywhere also the fact so that there's a war on on traditional um you know they call it residues probably uh, that they have to get rid of and you see it also in the in this surveillance capitalism approach right whatever has to do with families and nations and uh, traditional structures has to disappear because it's holding us back from this global system where everybody's in one in one single sphere where you can actually start controlling and monitoring whatever you want as long mm -hmm. as you have these this compartments that's that's Counter counterproductive so it's there, there's a war on everything that is seen as prehistoric and and conservative and uh, because it stands in the way of, of what they want to achieve right right which is branded to us as oh it's progress right it's progress well progress yeah. Yeah. towards yeah. what what are you progressing towards it's always these pie in the sky ideas of transformation of man of a new human being right even like hillary clinton gave a speech at a, a university i forget what year it was and she says what we are working towards is a uh, a a a, a, ch a fundamental change in um, a, in mankind and how we we see ourselves in the world, right? So you know the, this um, this push towards a transition, it's like it's endless transition, it's endless revolution, and everything becomes a revolutionary evolutionary process that should be shifted, managed. And ultimately, uh, to be perfected in some like weird eschatological utopia that, of course, I, I would say we're we're never going to see. You're not going to make a worldly utopia by just social engineering people into being subservient, uh, you know, soy sludge consumers. Um, and uh, yeah, I think these are these are very dangerous ideas. Yeah, and it's it's this this I, this this mindset where you think that everything will evolve towards, you know. 
omega <laughs> where everything mm -hmm. you know becomes perfection uh, and then all the the annoying things will disappear so that there's there's an open war on on, on religion and on nations and on family structures uh, by some of those think tanks be behind this that that's that's mm -hmm. clear the uh, which is of course yeah, it's it polarizes society to to a high degree as well yeah yeah have you read i don't i think you really like this book i mean it's a it's a crazy big book um uh james h billington fire in the minds of men um no it's it's a book by he was a former librarian of congress and he's you know he's an academic uh he, he taught history at princeton and harvard uh fire in the minds of men i think you would love this book it's about it's it, um, it's called the origins of the revolutionary faith. And he, you know, is tracing back these ideas of, you know, the, the revolution, the so-called revolution, which, you know, ties into what we're talking about here. Um, and, uh, kind of gives like a history and an analysis on where that comes from. He really looks at the French revolution. A lot of the ideas that we see now about, you know, perfecting man, perfecting the food systems, depopulation, that these were very prominent ideas within the, uh, you know, among the French revolutionaries and uh, then the Bolshevik revolutionaries. And now the great reset revolutionaries, their yeah, ideas do seem to come from the same thing. This, uh, you know, transformation, utopia, it's like this idea of like, Kiliasm, right? The uh, idea of the thousand year Reich mm. or the thousand year reign of, uh, you know, of a perfect, of a perfected man. Um, yeah. yeah they're, they're religious ideas. Mm -hmm. Yes. Within the Global Commons Alliance, of course, you'll find the EAT Foundation. And the EAT Foundation also doesn't hide it. I mean, they, they openly say that they are a Davos for food. They define themselves as a devils for food. I mean, it's absolutely clear. By the way, the founder of the Eat Foundation is a young global leader, so mm. it is modeled on the World Economic Forum. Okay, so so have no make no mistake here. The Eat Foundation, the Planetary Health Diet, is modeled on the World Economic Forum. That's so. It's no surprise that the World Economic Forum is very supportive of this. It's their dietary branch, essentially. You know, they're arguing for the great transformation. They're arguing for the great reset. And that's when you get the great food transformation. So, so essentially, this is this is the dietary branch of the of the World Economic Forum setup. It can not be more obvious. Mm -hmm. um, this is about the Norwegian component of it all. Um, the, the president of the World Economic Forum is uh, Berge Brende, uh, which is a former politician. Norwegian politician, and he's now he's now president. Um, now Yara is also very much involved in many of the things we're seeing, the fertilizer company. So there's a there's a huge Norwegian component here, and the founder of Eat is a Norwegian citizen as well. So that's uh, so that's uh, also then of course it, it also explains why the Norwegian government uh, has been uh, pumping money into the United. You know, United Nations Food System Summit and specifically into Action Track 2. Action Track 2 is the one that was chaired by the founder of the Eat Foundation. So the Eat Foundation was basically in charge of, of the Action Track 2 within the United Nations Food System Summit, which was the one on sustainable diets. And was that Gunhild Stordelen? Yes. The, yes. Who, who, she's like the wife of a billionaire. Yeah, um, yes. They're now divorced, I think, ex wife, yes. But um, yes, that's her here on, on the right. Uh, and next to Berge Brende. So this this says that Berge Brende got inspired by Gunhild Stora. So they also, of course, are in touch with each other. Uh, so th there's a there's a Norwegian component here as well that is that is um, that is linked to it. And it means that governments. What I want to say with this is that governments are also involved in this. This is now obvious for for you know they have the Norwegian connection, but also other governments are mm. are. Uh, and governmental organizations are, are interested in this. And, so and India, de facto, any any government who signed on to like the climate, uh, the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, you know, they will be engaging with these organizations and moving towards these goals. Um, yes, and then the, the, the question is, to which degree will that involve diets? And uh, the idea was to have um, a dietary link through the United Nations Food System Summit, so to make that part of you know the agreements and to have enforce it, to enforce um, transition in the diets as part of the the overall SDG uh, agendas. 
and this is some you know some information related to the food system summit so you had five action tracks i mentioned action track two which is the one on sustainable diets um and now, I mean, we, I'll have to be a bit short on this or we go on forever, but <laughs> okay, basically, it went the, <laughs> basically the food system summit didn't uh, end the way some people were expecting it to end uh, because many things happened and we don't have time to talk about this. And, uh, but it's, it's a long, it's, it's, an, it's a fascinating story on its own, uh, but um, it didn't, I mean, it didn't achieve this, uh, this um, uh, Utopia it didn't create a perfected humankind. <laughs> no, it, it didn't go. It didn't go they were so there. close. They were so close. <laughs> no, but it, it wanted to enforce certain things, and it didn't manage to do so. Um, yeah. And and then the outcome Thankfully. was not all that favorable for for the plantary health diet either. Even though they were in charge of an action track, and that's because many things went wrong during the process. Uh, so they came out with a final conclusion, uh, and they. Um, identified certain areas of action and coalitions of action and um and it talks about healthy diets and so on but not about the planetary health diet or about anything more specific uh, of course now what will happen is that there is going to be a battle over words over over the wordings over the semantics of it all because healthy diet can mean about everything right i mean your type of healthy diet is not the same as the healthy diet that the ones in the, in the eat foundation are, are looking at mm. so healthy will have to be defined and also things like the true cost of food and you already see this is uh, this is uh, one of those recent vegan movies uh, where they uh, refer to the true cost of food um so the rockefeller I'll foundation the, talks about that in their recent uh yeah, that they all will talk about this that's the thing they will all talk about the same words because it's a battle over those words if you so the, and those are words, pointing towards social credits carbon credits right the true cost of food is basically like you know it, it's like social accounting and is, sustainability yeah. accounting which is social credits yeah yeah, it is. A, it's about account. I mean, there's a lot of accountancy here, and a lot of it is a financial outlook on this. That is, uh, we'll come back to this. But it, but it, but it's going to be. And the SDGs. You mentioned this before. The SDGs are. They all sound great. Okay. I mean, it's all about improving things. But the SDGs are uh, the ones that have implemented the SDGs have created a framework that is now being used and. And it's interesting to see the the role of people like uh, Polman before, and and even uh, so in in the in the establishment of the SDGs, um, so you had there was a committee of of wise men and women that were responsible of you know developing the whole thing in consultation with others, and you you and and on that committee you you had people like Paul Polman, which is the ex CEO of Unilever, um, uh, Podesta was there. <laughs> uh, mm. John Podesta, and then also uh, David Cameron, for instance, was also there. So, I mean, those well, people... Podesta is also really interested in the UFO thing with, the you know, Lawrence Rockefeller as well. He's another one of these kind of new agey UFO stuff. I mean, he's also involved in other things, you know, unsavory <laughs> people. And, but, uh, yeah, he's, he's also UFO cult connected guy. Strange. Back to the new something. age religion thing, you know. There must be something out there then. <laughs> um, <laughs> The aliens, clearly. Uh, so the, the thing, <laughs> so the SDGs basically are as such beneficial, but it's it everything is going to be uh, won by defining what they actually mean. You know, it's it's, a, it's it's the meaning has to be filled in. So it's like an open open box, and the people that win the the definition of the SDGs in more in the specifics, you know, in, in the devil is in the details. Uh, those ones will actually steer the agendas. So everybody will talk about the true cost of food. Everybody will talk about you know the fashionable light uh, terminologies because it's about defining them and then setting the agenda. Um, so action track two was chaired by you know Eats uh, founder. Uh, the vice chair was also related to Eat. The coordinator of the scientific group was a Neat Lancet commissioner. So the whole management of the track was in the hands of the EAT Foundation. Now, the EAT Foundation clearly stated that their goal was to take full advantage of the summit. They, they published on, this on their website, to force the kinds of far-reaching changes that the world now desperately needs. So we, we all need, we all beg for their far-reaching changes, and, and they are going to take full advantage to make sure that this is happening. And, and notice that, of course, again, we have the word reset here. It's, it's again, resetting the world's course. Uh, yeah. Now, this is from on the left side here. This is from the Eat Lancet uh, report. 
And there they say that uh, we shouldn't let the change of the food system to the food system depend on the whim of consumer choice. You know, that we cannot do that. Whoa. Yeah, we can't let the plebs choose what they eat. You know, no, they'll just no. make more global warming and unsustainability. By contrast, you know, what we need is hard policy interventions. Okay. So that's 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 we were seeing this in in the Rockefeller in in in, in the Rockefeller Commission report on you know the American future. Uh, it's that people will not like it, so we have to choose those options, uh, and so f but but we will need to force them anyway. And uh, you know this this thing that they understand that the public will not appreciate it, and mm. we will have to you know is but hard policy interventions, and that's what we saw in the in the in the soft to hard policy spectrum range from WWF and from the World Resources Institute that I showed before. The hard policy interventions are what we need. Now, this is coming from a scientific paper. And normally, it is not done in scientific papers to mix science and policy. You don't do that. I mean, mm -hmm. you publish a scientific paper. You don't mix it with policy. It, but okay, that's a discussion of its own. Yeah, um, yeah, no, I'm more, I mean, science has become, I mean, it really, we've seen, especially the last couple of years, you know, yeah. just made major politicization of science, unfortunately. The scientific process has been misrepresented, especially, you know, a lot of this dietary, planetary diet stuff. It's, um, yeah. they, they claim, in the name of science, they are actually destroying the scientific method very often yes. with this. Yeah, yeah. And then it's, and then again, it's about, defining the science the one that defines science or that defines the, the right science is the one that will win the battle so it's the mm. it's about defining what is the right science and defining what is the wrong science and then you have the fact checkers and the, you know <laughs> and mm. it becomes it becomes very dangerous <clears throat> so within action track two uh so except from the ones i just named you also had the youth vice chair which is a, a young vegan uh, climate activist well i know she's vegan but she's she's very much pro-veganism Mm -hmm. um, so she was uh, at Johns Hopkins, not Johns Hopkins, and she. So this is an article on uh, about how she convinced uh, uh, Duncan to add vegan sausage to the menu and so on. <laughs> so she was like, nobody fast. asks for this. Like, what can she call a Dunkin' Donuts? Like, oh man, I really wish I could get a vegan sausage with my five donuts and my crappy coffee. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but well, it, it's you know it facilitated her position to, uh, as a youth vice chair, um, and then the anchoring agency. So every track has an anchoring agency. Was WHO, the World Health Organization, and the the, the most relevant person here is Francesco Branca, which is an Eat, Com Eat Lancet commissioner. And this is an article from Francesco Branca, Johns Hopkins again, um, on healthy and sustainable diets. And what is the headline? Everything has to be reset. No, it's, you see, it's it's not <laughs> it's not about. Uh, optimizing or improving no it's about resetting everything is wrong we have to reset we have to start from scratch it's all bad <laughs> you know? this is that revolutionary language too it's revolution it's it, yeah. it we're evolving everything. this everything mm. not, 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 not the bad parts of no everything has to be reset not everything uh, even your xbox <laughs> the great reset mm. and that of course implies much smaller amounts of meat uh, and then we need to reset, and then it's about policies, investments on the supply side and the consumer side, and WHO will be working on the consumer side. Interestingly, also, he believes that a cultural shift can be achieved collectively, so there's a cultural shift in, involved here as well. And that comes back all the time. That's what Gus Pet from the World Resources Institute and the TELUS uh, Institute said before, you know, in one of the previous slides. He was saying, like, no, the science will not bring us there. Uh, we need a spiritual and cultural shift Mm -hmm. Crazily enough, is that the innovation pillar was in the hands of the Good Food Institute. Now, the Good Food Institute is the is the main lobby worldwide for uh, all the the vegan tech, you know, all the alternative proteins, mm -hmm. and it's founded by Bruce Friedrich, which is ex PETA. So he was one of the main strategists for PETA. You see him on the right here. Meet oh, your wow. meat. <laughs> so those guys were in charge of the innovation pillar, and then the uh, civil society. Uh, uh, sorry, maybe some more information on the Good Food Institute. This person here is a member of its advisory board. Uh, he's also mentioned on the Eid Foundation side. And it's ah, the, His Royal Highness Prince Khalid bin Al Walid. We, yes. he's, a, he's another, he owns a vegan YouTube channel. He, you know, his father oh, is, oh. is a uh, Saudi prince. And his yeah. father, his dad actually sold a, a, a yacht to Trump that was used as a Bond villain's lair in an actual Bond movie. I mean, <laughs> his, 
His father, his father has these palatial estates. They have like gold. They have no diamond encrusted Mercedes Benzes. These people. Oh and, yes, uh, he's one of the richest persons of. of uh, oh yeah. Of the whole country, right? I mean, yeah. He's, oh yeah. His, his dad, his um, his dad has these palatial estates full of trophy hunted African wild game animals and stuff. And but no, they're going to save the planet. This is for the animals and the planet and all that. Yeah. So so this is this is cool. I mean, this is what he. He uh, suggests uh, dairy is the root of all environmental evil, and he's on a mission to veganize the Middle East. Now, good luck with that. <laughs> and then, so he he invests loads of money in in things like uh, Just uh, and in the Beyond Burgers. Uh, so that's you know that's the Good Food Institute basically. That's those kind of yeah. people. You know, it's it's uh, rich people, investment funds. Uh, but he, he's also invested in like uh, lab grown meat, and then also yeah, a lot yeah, of the yeah, C forty yeah. cities type stuff, and then the. Uh, right. Right. Um, he's, these are like big investors in the fourth industrial revolution tech. You know, it's crazy. So he says dairy is a root of all environmental yes. evil. There's yeah. this video of his dad flying out at, in a helicopter to the middle of the desert in Saudi Arabia to meet with, a, to have this big party and they're drinking raw camel milk out there. Like they're like milking the camels. And there's this video on YouTube of like his lifestyle, this guy's father, who this, <laughs> that's where this guy's money comes from. I think yeah, he convinced his father to become vegan. I think I'm not sure. But anyway, well, um, they were drinking raw camel milk in this video, so he must have been on an off day. <laughs> maybe, it, <laughs> maybe it was a plant based camel. I don't know. Uh, but, yes, yes, uh, it must be. <laughs> but it was a beyond camel. You know, <laughs> this is, you know, this is what you you face when you talk about the Good Food Institute. Now, this is Good Food Institute kind of people as well. So you know, those are all those vegan leaders. They call themselves themselves vegan political leaders, and they meet here at the United Nations headquarters for a summit. And this was a kind of backstage party where they all met up. So this is uh, Al Walid. Uh, this is uh, Stoltenberg from Eat. Um, and you know, that's so they they're they're so there's this. Um, flirting in a way, you know, between the Eat Foundation and, and those imitation foods um, that that became clear in the in the action track too. Uh, this is uh, again to show what they actually did want to achieve through those you know vegan technologies. This is a, a quote from Impossible Foods, uh, and again it's 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 tweeted by by uh, uh where they talk about you know pushing the, the whole beef market into a death spiral. No, that's that's <laughs> that's to be the, the way they think. You know, it has to be pushed into a death spiral. Now, this is an investment. This is an investment terminology, right? But it, it's yeah, also it's, warfare, economic warfare. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, it's also yes. genocide language. I mean, when you're actually what you're really talking <laughs> yeah, about is destroying language. rural farmers. Yeah. Uh, you know, absolutely. Okay. Um, and then this was this was absolutely crazy. Civil society was represented with an action track too. So civil, so that's you and me. No. Mm, oh yeah, I remember yeah. sending my delegate. <clears throat> we were represented by the CEO of Fifty by Forty, and Fifty by Forty is a, is an organization. So Fifty by Forty means that we have to reduce livestock with fifty percent by two thousand and forty. That's Fifty by Forty. So it's 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 its mission is anti livestock. You know, it's about halving livestock by two thousand and forty. Which again, again, which is a proxy measurement for rural populations. Livestock are directly correlated. The existence of livestock requires management from human beings, right? So it's a specific way of life. It's a specific type of person that is really being targeted here. And bring it back home to this again. This is, this is seeking to eliminate the way of life of small family farms, the very people we should be supporting in order to improve our situation environmentally, to improve our situation nutritionally. They want to get rid of those, right? So it's like what we advocate here for regenerative agriculture, for supporting local ranchers, right? If you're in the U.S., you know, websites like eatwild.com where you can get in touch with local food producers and get, uh, you know, good quality animal foods and plant foods available from local producers – these they, they want to get rid of this, but you know Nestle and uh, Kellogg's that's all sustainable. It's it's backwards. So having in mind that the whole organization wants is I mean the, the mission of this organization representing civil society is to half livestock. Um, it, it becomes interesting if you look at what this organization how this organization is functioning. So it's a consortium of different players, and some of them are very. Uh, interesting as such. Uh, the Good Food Institute is there. Surprise, surprise. Uh, the World Resources Institute is there. Uh, the True Animal Protein Price Coalition, the true price of food, remember? 
is also there. Uh, compassion World Farming is there, uh, all sorts of uh, animal rights organizations. Uh, you have to just have a look, you'll see plenty of them. Uh, Greenpeace is there. Uh, and then who's there as well? Physicians Committee for Responsible, Medi uh, for Responsible Medicine. That's Neil Barnard's um, mm -hmm. group. It's a PETA front, basically. Uh, yeah. And it's you know, so they're, they're hardliners in, in, in the vegan space. Yes, yeah, and they and they do a lot of you know vegan street theater exactly, um, yes, yes. stuff, and they're very well funded. You know, connected yes. to like Walter Willett and Harvard yeah. as well. And then you have the True Health Initiative, uh, which is which has Walter Willett on its board of directors, by the way, uh, <laughs> and David Katz. So don't don't forget that Walter Willett is the first author of the Eat Lancet report. Oh, true. Forgot about that. Yeah. So it's I mean it comes from somewhere, um, and the, both the physicians. Committee and the True Health Initiative, at some not so long ago, have tried to prevent the publication of a series of articles that were showing that the eating of meat actually. I mean, uh, the articles were looking at the evidence relating the consumption of meat uh, with um, morbidity and mortality. Mm. Okay, and they were saying the evidence is very weak. They were saying, okay, that we, we see associations, but we cannot be sure that they're just not, not confounded, you know, they're not necessarily causal, and, and the evidence is very weak in general. So we sh and, and they recommended basically we shouldn't worry about it and we can just keep on eating as we're eating for health reasons. They didn't say anything yeah. about the environment, okay? It's just about health. Uh, so those, so the True Health Initiative and the Physicians Committee have tried to block this publication. So they have tried to prevent that scientific papers were published in a journal. And it's like scientific violated. cancel culture, basically. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, so even before they were published, uh, they, so they violated the embargo of the paper in the first place, and then they bombarded the the, the editor with with bots uh, with emails, so that the inbox exploded, mm -hmm. uh, and there was a whole campaign uh, trying to prevent publication. Wow! So that's the point we've reached. So so Walter Willett was involved. In, Again, that's Harvard, right? And Harvard, yeah, yeah. You know, there's the famous exactly. David Rockefeller uh, uh, has his library <laughs> there. You know, Harvard is a you know, very uh, uh, prestigious university. Heavily it, got, it, got out of hand. It, it got completely out of hand because uh, it, it was followed by a smear campaign trying to discredit the authors. And the, other, the authors of this art series of articles were not just random scientists. I mean, the whole consortium was... Um, under uh, so the last author, I mean, the the, 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 the most senior author there was uh, uh, Gordon Guyatt from McMaster's University, and he's he's one of the founding fathers of the evidence based medicine uh, approach. So, using evidence, I mean, if, if you so his his philosophy is if you want to have a medical intervention or statement, you should use good standards of evidence. And he developed a great approach to, to qualify evidence. So he's, mm -hmm. he's a big name. He's a huge name in, in the field of evidence-based medicine. And he was involved in this consortium. So it's not just, you know, senior, junior, uh, uh, unknown scientist. This was, these were important people. Um, and then they launched a smear campaign trying to accuse the consortium of conflicts of interest. Um, saying that, well, there was a study in connection with Ilse on sugar by one of the authors, and which had nothing to do with this paper in the first place. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, in in the end, the the, the, the ones that were blaming <laughs> uh, the the consortium for for uh, conflicts of interest are, uh, you know, completely. Uh, immersed in, in in their own conflicts of interest, they have all sorts of conflicts of interest from from their own side. Uh, so it was it was very uh, painful to watch it. I mean, to, to watch it unfold, uh, and and it was really yeah, was a, a catastrophe, I would say, for the credibility of nutritional sciences and for nutritional yeah. physiology. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's to me, unfortunately, it's it's not even surprising at this point to see this type of behavior coming from people like Walter Willett uh, and, and and for even, you know, Harvard as an institution, especially seeing that, I mean, Harvard was instrumental for bringing about the so-called green revolution, which is the industrialization of farming and the gene revolution and the, you know, uh, the, 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 um, the, the GMO revolution that came through Harvard from Rockefeller Foundation funding as well. So it's, it's unfortunately sad, but they, the policies, nutritional policies and the scientific, the politicization of science coming through Harvard is something that's, uh, that's been a longstanding problem.
Yeah, well, the, also the, the nutritional conflicts of interest from uh, at Harvard go go back a long time mm. uh, before we let. Um, anyway, so let's let's just you know let's let's skip this part, and then you have a couple of work streams that were linked to the action track to, uh, too, and then uh, again you'll find the World Resources Institute, the WWF, something called the F Good Food Fund, which is uh, led by a Chinese vegan and is and is uh, is financed by the Chinese government. <laughs> so how did oh, it end nice. up here? Is, in, um, brighter green again, animal rights. Uh, so in the entire action track too was in the hands of this kind of movement right this was the this was this was the the atmosphere within action track too uh, that backfired and then and um it didn't work out work out as they as they wanted to <clears throat> but it's i think it's still relevant for us to look uh, at what they wanted to achieve and then we don't have to look at the outcomes of the summit but we have to look at the early stages of the summit when they were drafting their working papers so this was drafted in December 2020, and uh, at that stage they defined healthy diets, and this is the definition of a healthy diet. So it said it talks about fruits and vegetables, excluding starchy roots, because Willet hates potatoes. <laughs> I don't know if you know that, but uh, potatoes you should. I mean, the, the Eat Lancet diet doesn't only say that you should not eat a lot of animal source foods; it also says you should hardly touch potatoes. Well, that's going to be really, I mean, they're like <laughs> something like 3,000 different varieties of tubers well, that are consumed in Africa. Yeah. You know, it's like they're just insane amounts of tubers that are consumed by a lot of traditional cultures. We um, should stop right now because <laughs> it's... I, yeah, we got to go tell all those Katavans and, uh, and yes. Peruvians that they're just not sustainable. Sorry, guys, we got to get rid of you. Eat the McDonald's um, foods. Yeah. And then, of course, if you say 400 grams of fruits and vegetables, vegetables is very flexible. You know, it can also be pea protein, for instance. You know, then oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> French fries. French fries can be vegetables, but that's a tuber, so that's not good. Yeah, like, no, that's not allowed because it's a starchy, you know, a starchy vegetable. Can't have those. Um, well, legumes, well, that's basically where you'll find your pea protein. Nuts and whole grains. Uh, and then they talk a bit about energy and about fats and types of fat and about your diet salt. All those things are part of healthy diets, uh, but no single animal source foods is mentioned here. So source food is mentioned wow. here. It's not not not, not any not even dairy or fish. Uh, nothing. Nothing is mentioned. It doesn't mean that you cannot have them, but you should eat it at very low levels, as the Atlantic diet recommends. Um, so they say that we should go to circular livestock levels. Uh, again, that sounds fantastic. I mean, it's, it's what we want, no? a circular system. But in, in their opinion, it means, of course, something very, very low. Uh, and if you do that, so if you take out this bulk of animal source foods out of human diets, you create a gap. Okay, there's a gap in food. You have mm -hmm. to fill it in. How are you going to fill it in? Well, microbial protein production in fermentation processes. Factory foods, foods again. Back to uh, the factories. Foods, exactly. The, back to the Rockefeller Commission report. Uh, food from factories. Um, now, Basically, is, they want to replace the cow's rumen with a giant... Yeah. Uh, metal vat in a in a in a huge factory that takes all sorts of mined minerals and uh, you know hydrocarbons that are being uh, burned in order to keep it running. But no, cows are bad. They've they're burping, and that's making that's making the weather bad. So we gotta throw the cows and the virgins in the volcano and have the factory <laughs> foods instead to save the planet. That's what exactly what Rethinks is saying. They're saying that the, the precision fermentation, so this microbial protein fermentation, <coughs> will lead to the collapse of the dairy and the cattle industry by 2030. So they will have to hurry up because we're almost there. Um, and Rethinks is uh, founded by Jamie Arbib, um, again, one of those rich people uh, from, from the UK this time. He's also on the advisory board of EAT. So essentially, the gap they're creating here in, in you know in the global diets has to be filled in by those companies that are in the periphery of you know the eat network. So that's why they are there, because they find the idea very interesting. And then uh, there's a whole uh, a whole paragraph, a whole section on policy change and interventionism. That's what we talked about before. And then you see again, you know. Different the spectrum, soft to hard policy interventions, taxes, subsidies, dietary guidelines, front of pack, changing foods in public canteens, um, and especially also divestment and exclusion of companies. That's the interesting part. So, what they want to achieve is that companies will be ranked 
and grade it according to the degree they meet the sustainable development goals. Okay. Social credits, back to the social yeah, credit yes, score. Yes. And that's that's where the, the idea of sustainable development goals finds its meaning. It's it's something that can be mobilized to grade things. If you so if you control the meaning of these DGs, you 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 have control over the investments. Mm -hmm. The investment fluxes. That's that's the battle now to, you know, to, to specify the SDGs in, in in its details, and then use that to rank companies. And by doing so, you will make companies more or less attractive. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it, it, and and that's what, what those big players are about. You know, the Black Rocks and the and the yeah. fairs, and, and so this is all about ranking companies. Yeah, and of course, all of BlackRock's companies and Vanguard's companies will be the highest ranked. And you know, Monsanto, so sustainable, you know, impeccable social credit for for Monsanto. But you know, your your small rancher who's trying to sell locally produced yeah. meat, he's bad. He's got a low social credit score. So if you if you don't play the game as well, the planners want you to play the game, then you'll be out of you'll be pushed out because yeah. you will be made unattractive. To investors, so mm -hmm. so the, the future is going to be a financial game. It's going to be about financial warfare, uh, and in in that's in that uh, you know from that point of view, uh, you can explain the existence of things like the World Benchmarking Alliance. The World Benchmarking Alliance. Uh, look, uh, look who's there, by the way. Eat Foundation, w, WBCSD, WWF, the Stockholm ah. Resilience Center. <laughs> you know, yeah. Always the same people. All our uh, same friends. <laughs> And and the UN, of course, the United Nations. It's, you just reconfigurate into different platforms. So what they will do is indeed benchmark organizations based on the SDGs and uh, and then shape attractiveness of, of companies to investors. That's what they yeah. want to achieve. So they, yeah. they want to win the battle by through financial fluxes. Mm -hmm. and, and through it's all it's economic warfare as well, right? So it means taxing things that you yes. say are bad, Imposing uh, sanctions, you know this. Right. It, but, on, but this is on... this is hardball, basically. I mean, nudging and, and dietary guidelines will not be powerful enough. No, this is powerful. This is like how you put the country on. This is the how you call this. I always forget it. Uh, standards and poor is that the thing? What they used to, to great countries? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure the. Uh... That's that's how they got Greece on its knees, right? This, this, hey. so you, you you downgrade a country to investors, and then the country collapses. Yep. Yep. Uh, and then, and so then you get when you're when the puppet politician becomes president. You know, the like in Ecuador, yeah, suddenly it's, things are relaxed again. You see, exactly. Like, oh, look, their grade went up. Now we can have investors. Now Nestle and Monsanto and Bayer can come into the country and help them be sustainable. It's. I mean, it's really. It's. 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 It's marketing. It's economic warfare, um, and it's. 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 It's really. Incredible. I mean, you've done such a, a great job at laying out the web of influence, which comes back to many of the same players um, that we're seeing in this, you know, this great reset, this great transformation, this stakeholder capitalism model that's being rolled out. And you, know, you see the same names there with the Rockefeller Foundation and, and our friends at the UN, World Business Council for Sustainable Development, EAT. Um, it, it's, it, it truly is um, very clear from what you've laid out here that this is moving us towards a control grid of our food supply, of human mobility, uh, you know, uh, of economic mobility that is um, very consolidated, would be a nice way of saying it. I think this is also a, it's a good summary here. This is from the Good Food Finance Network. So, they're diff so you see that this whole finance thing finds more and more momentum because they're different you know variations on it but again all with the same players so the good food finance networks specifically states that they will bring sustainable food systems to the heart of the finance agenda so that's that's the game hmm. okay fair is a big player fair is they, they manage what is it 25 trillion in combined assets so a huge uh, and and their goal is to end factory farming the, their, uh, the factory farming that they created, yeah, exactly. Right? They, they want, whatever yeah. they define as factory farming, so that, that's that's because, of course, they need to sell the idea. But you have to know that the, that the, the one in charge of fair, Jeremy Collar, is a vegan, um, and he says he wants to end factory farming. But you know, they will, it's not the, the the end point is not factory farming. No, they'll call my homestead a factory farm. Anybody, you know, yeah. you got yes. you got thirty chickens. Oh my goodness, factory farm. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, you so, got, so they got call the, the, the colleague depictions, you know, of romanticized 
uh, ideas on, on you know livestock farming, uh, which are completely unrealistic and and, and not. So they, so they they create a false illusion that they want you know good practices and not the bad practices, but that's not what it's really about. Yeah, you know, you need uh, ten acres per pig. Every pig needs to have you know a uh, yeah. you, you got to have a four seasons for each cow, and you know <laughs> they got to have iPads and VR goggles for them. All. It's like it's really absurdist when you look at the standards they want they implement. Um, yeah. And by the way, it's, ec it's economic warfare. By the way, fair color, uh, the, the colors so the director of fair or the ceo of fair is also on the advisory board of the good food institute so it's you see that with the good food institute mindset and uh, it's not about ending factory farming it's about ending everything and just getting to their types of food mm -hmm. uh, so only more, factory food which is the, the actual foods for factories yes, and well, factory 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 farming. Farming. <laughs> yeah when like when they say factory farming i mean in the us what the, the implement they implemented this feedlot model where they finish animals on grain and that is that's all that was all implemented through these big ag comp uh, companies through big pharma companies uh, monsanto corn uh, you know, cargo right these are the companies they say oh, this is factory farming and this is bad they created that model right now mo the cows are completely, still yeah, and it's ahead. completely irrelevant for for where i'm coming from i mean we, this is we, we don't have kfos in <laughs> in our yeah. regions uh, right so like the netherlands like the 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 the, UK, the dutch government wants to pay you're not in the netherlands but they're, they're yeah, an example they want to pay farmers to get rid of their livestock right. Right. and you know they they're, they're literally buying out farms and telling them don't produce animal foods because it's bad for the environment right okay well let's move on so the, on the right side the food systems economics commission again support tools and metrics for the policy and investment community so it's about controlling the metrics how you measure it if you if you define the metrics you're in charge and then again you know potsdam institute eat foundation food and land use coalition remember the ones that want to uh, get Australians to eat 90 percent less red meat um, and then you see all kinds of variations this is one uh, example where again you find exactly the same people the good food institute here bruce frederick there's 50 by 40 ceo the one representing civil society in the in the in the food system summit uh eats founder the uh, the um, chief executive Wait, they call her dr stordelin now she got a doc how did she get a she became she, she, she has a phd in uh, i don't remember what exactly uh, something is it honorary the honorary phd from harvard something, no no she has an actual <laughs> phd in the, in the medical okay. field but i'm can't remember um Limbury is, is you know he's uh, from compassion world farming they were very much working in the background in in the food system summit to get things their way as well uh jeremy collar here this is uh so the the cio uh, of of the fair initiative so he's basically the guy behind the fair initiative and this is what they're doing you see here companies scored uh tesco uh unilever and on uh, oh, sorry um the max the highest scores and then it goes down uh so you you better end up on the left side of the mm. uh, of the bar diagram and all, so, all the biggest companies and then the people that yeah. are invested in the board members their their companies just happen to be the highest scored wow <laughs> and it's called rethinking protein and it's about concentrating on legal mechanisms so you see it's, it's about if it's not only the financial massive force it's also about legalizing the mechanisms so that we can even make it uh, more stringent uh, and there are plenty of interesting names on this uh, graph here and i will not go into its details just look at this person here tim benton uh, he's from chatham house and this is him here making a promotion for the impossible burger and he's also involved in the land use policies for a net zero uk it's a committee on climate change and uh, so he was chairing the diets expert work workshop and uh, lo and behold for diet change they suggest a shift in diets away from red meat and dairy and once more consider stronger options if softer measures prove insufficient so again mm. this you know hard policy interventions stronger um, options yeah i wonder what <laughs> yeah, they, they, they just and it's funny how it just gets well, they're, they're defined we've seen them before the stronger options you know is this uses taxes banning uh mm. that's that's what the stronger options are yeah let's just let's just send out drones and and, and just start gunning down people's livestock you know that's, like, that's, that's, that's well, a, a strong option <laughs> the, the strongest option nuclear option <laughs> on its advisory board you have a director from blackrock so, so if this is really about, you know, if this is about 
improving the diets of people. I mean, and, and you know, to be fair, in, in the Eat Lancet Commission, you have uh, you have good scientists. I mean, it's not all bad within the Eat Lancet Commission. Uh, mm. the, the final conclusion and the way and the way the report came out is, is a disaster. But within the, I mean, the fact that, that the commission comes together to think about diets is not bad, and there are some people which are uh, respectable science within the commission. So not everybody is the same. It's a heterogeneous set of, of things. Yeah. Uh, but it's but 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 then again, you have the fact that it's modeled on the World Economic Forum, so it's hijacked by by those forces. And also, if this is really about just about improving diets and, and health of people, what is it? What is BlackRock doing on the advisory board? What what, what, what on earth is BlackRock doing there? Well, they they do own a lot of the companies, or you know, they're major. Well, they own everything. <laughs> <I> mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, but most but, residential I mean, properties. And, you know, yeah. they, they could work through the. I mean, but, but they're ex they're in person. They are in the advisory board. Well, you need the philanthropists. Yes. involved in stuff like this you know if you're going to make a utopia you're going to have to get some some philanthropists involved um we're almost there but uh so the united nations food system summit didn't bring what they actually wanted and and again there are several reasons for that but um it's not going to stop here it's not because it's it's failed that it will just end here so the next steps are already being taken so the, the chairs of the food system summit are regrouping and they're now um together in a, how's it called? The Food Forward Consortium, yet another one. Um, and it's GAIN, WWF, CARE, uh, EAT, but also the Club of Rome has entered the game, hmm. suddenly. So the Club Our of Rome joined them. Yeah. yeah, the Club of Rome uh, is going to give it, you know, <laughs> a new... Yeah. Limits new to growth, remember, limits to growth, and then this ties in with the idea of planetary boundaries, which, the, you know, Eat Lancet is... So yeah. it's the same and language. It's, it's it's the just same. include also like a, a picture of what the, the limits to growth was actually doing. So you have this primitive computer, which at the time it was state of the art, but it's, you know, if you look back at it, and this is what it came, <laughs> came out of it, you know. Mm. This is, this is uh, the evolution of of population and industrial output and resources and uh, so it's so ex extremely simplistic and reductionist and completely yeah. idiotic to think that you can model something so complex ahead of you know everything happening you know, it's just extrapolating to the future based on a couple of assumptions a silly program run on a silly computer mm -hmm. and then you come up with a report that is a, that is you know, influencing policies worldwide well, uh, well, where else have we seen this the last couple of years? Uh, it's almost yeah, it's, it's, almost it's, like this model has been used in other aspects of our life to, uh, you know, advance social control mechanisms and do economic warfare. Um, <laughs> no, so actually, the, actually the, this, this kind of graph at the bottom here is, is the kind of graphs I produce in my research. But I do this in, you know, in bioreactors with, with microbial populations, mm -hmm. uh, heavily controlled systems without any interference from the outside if everything yeah. is heavily controlled and i model their substrate consumption and their metabolite production and their population mm -hmm. growth i do this i mean this is my this is my research and it's already and, and they're difficult. pretending to do this for the entire for the world whole. ecosystem all yeah. of creation we yeah. can just model it and then we can just manipulate it it's very it's very megalomaniacal, right? I mean, it's you're you're not when you look at human populations, you're not looking at a small microbial. You're not looking at flies in a jar like Malthus was looking at. Exactly. <laughs> you know, yeah, so it's, they're not accounting for. It's really difficult enough to do it for one strain of of of, 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 of you know of bacteria and, and try to get this right in the, in the model. Right. Uh, stand. I mean, um, and then something very concerning is, and, and this is something you suggested before, uh, you know, the Paris Agreement. So. Um, one way to cement this into policy is to is to move towards an a IPCC for food. So I, the IPCC came out of the Rio summit, yeah, and it became something you know that is policy connected. So they want to they wanted to use the food system summit to create an IPCC for food, mm -hmm. um, so that basically you will have a Paris Agreement type of of, of uh, affair going on. But it's, uh, of course, the ones that are pushing for an IPCC for food are, again, the same players. But mm. It has been exposed in this report from IPIS Food, where they basically show that it's the World Economic Forum behind it. Uh, and, and the idea for, for an IPCC for food is already decades, uh, a decade old at least. Uh, in 2015, um, it was mentioned uh, by a German uh, organization, Center for Development Research, 
um, and they called for uh, an IPCC uh, type thing, and and, th and uh, th the director of that uh, of that organization was Joachim von Braun, which is was the chair of the scientific group of the United Nations Food Systems Summit, and he's also uh, closely linked to to Davos. He was a speaker at Rio, you know, heavily involved in everything. Uh, he, he's not related to to Werner and von Braun. <laughs> so it's, well, who knows? <laughs> I don't think so. I hope not. It's a pretty, it's a pretty, com it's a pretty common. Would it be surprising at this point? Right? <laughs> like yeah, jo Joachim de Fiore, which is another one of these kind of utopian thinkers. You know, I don't know. It's just, uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyways, <laughs> I think we already have enough solid connections that are crazy enough. <laughs> 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 in 2017, uh, the World Economic Forum talked about a long-term vision for an IPCC for food uh, and so on. So this is going to be the next step. You know, they, they want an IPCC for food and they will do everything to get it because this has been, you know, they've been working towards this for since since a while now and, and mm. this is where they want to land. Wow. So that's something wow. to watch for the and is, and that, is this 2022? Are they going to have a meeting or is there any, any what, what are the keywords that are we using? What are the organizations that people can maybe track or, you know, I mean, for people who are trying to push back against this, I mean, I've, I've said several times, look, support local agriculture, support your local ranchers, produce some of your own food. This is how we can stop this, right? Supporting through our choices economically. Um, the, the people that are actually producing good food, but uh, yeah, what 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 should we be looking for in the next year? What are some of the trends that you um, see coming that uh, that are coming down the pipeline? Well, I mean, I've, I've shown the various players, right? So if you keep track of those players, you'll you'll understand when something is going in that direction. Um, the the IPCC for food is something that will be on the agendas. Uh, the the whole finance uh, agenda is also very important to follow. The fact that finance will be uh, where, it will, where things will play out, um, and then there's something else that was that I didn't mention. Uh, I should have maybe included it, but there's something in the working paper of the of the United, of the action track two in the in the summit. Uh, so except for the for you know the policy things, there's also something on the cultural uh, side, uh, and they say that one of the objectives should be to change the perception of food in the youngest generations. That they should, again, reset or, or, or completely transform the way that young people look at food. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, again, this cultural, almost spiritual shift um, that uh, that needs to be achieved in the, in, at the youngest levels. That's because they know that people that are older will not change. They want to, mm -hmm. you know, start with a new generation. Yeah, and, social and engineering the younger generation. Yeah, so it's so I think they will the effort will be on the youngest generations. It will and it will be done by infiltrating school curricula. Uh, they have, for instance, something called the Good Life Goals, and it's cartoonish kind of figures that translate to sustainable development goals to make it attractive wow. to children. And uh, one of those cartoons is, of course, saying "Eat plant based," right? Yeah. Uh, so I think they're going to put a massive effort in in. Uh, changing um you know or, or influencing the, the the very young to to move towards uh, as much as they can to plant based diet you already see it happening right it's already the case yeah. um yeah. and it will get worse and and they will try to get it out of school canteens i mean they get meat and and, and animal yep. foods out of school canteens um so that's going to happen i guess uh, it will become increasingly difficult for farmers for livestock farmers to operate and for farmers in general, right? I mean, we talk, yeah. I, I talk a lot about, about animal source foods because it's, it happens to be my expertise in my research, but it's valid for all farming. Um, I mean, for all you know, wholesome <laughs> ways of yeah. farming, it's it's uh, standing in the way. They want to, and, and livestock farming in particular, and especially there's a, there's a war on, on, on cattle mostly, more than yeah. poultry and pigs. Why is that? Because cattle uses a lot of land, right? Yeah. They, they take up land. The land is the resource. It's, it's the World Resources Institute, you know, the banker overseen organization. It's not just, it should be called the Control Over World Resources Institute. <laughs> the World but, Resource <laughs> Consolidation <laughs> Institute. It's about, it's about, it's a battle for resources. I mean, resources will be the thing of the future. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They, like I said, there will be wars over water, right? This is, it really is, it's economic warfare, it's cultural warfare. 
And, um, and again, food, what we eat, how we see food uh, and, and, and nutrition, these, these are important tools, right? Like, uh, you know, Kissinger's famous quote that, uh, you know, a, a journalist attributed to him, uh, he said, you control oil, you control the nations, you control food, you control the people. And um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think you've, you've done a, a, a very elegant job at mapping out the influence and control through these NGOs, corporations, banking, uh, big finance um, over our food supply. And I greatly appreciate you coming on again. I, I, I want to respect your time. And of course, I want to, you know, I'm going to bug you to come back on again sometime if I can, if I can do it. And yeah, Dr. Frederick Leroy, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, thank you so much for the work you do. Where can people find you? And where can uh, people look into a little bit uh, more of your work or maybe even support the work that you do? Uh, you, you'll find me on Twitter. Um, it, uh, the handle is FLEROY 1974. And you can, and in my Twitter handle, you also see a link to a website which is called Aleph 2020, which is um, a rather scientific text uh, in defense of animal agriculture. So, uh, um, bringing the arguments uh, both related to nutrition and health and environmental aspects and ethical aspects and uh, with links to the primary sources and you know the, the scientific source material um, making a case for indeed you know improved systems but you know not abolishing it improving them uh, but from a, a you know evidence-based uh, outlook um, and you also find a section on 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 the on, on the you know the the, the push against like uh, animal source foods and and the, the great food transformation on that website with uh, links to the to many things we said today. Perfect, perfect. Um, Dr. Frederick Leroy, again, honored to have you on. Thank you so much. I really really appreciate the conversation. And it's been, you know, I really appreciate being able to interact with you over the last couple of years on uh, Twitter. My, my, uh, I'm, I'm glad to know you and honored to speak to you here. So thank you so very much. And, um, and I will be, I will be bothering you to come back on again as we, <laughs> as we see this stuff getting rolled out more and more. So that's uh, the his Twitter handle again, at F. L E R O Y F Leroy 1974. And I actually just dropped it in the chat on YouTube okay. as well as on Rockfin. So you guys can link to that and make sure to follow him over there. Um, thank you so much for coming on, sir. I really appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Tristan. That was a pleasure. All right. Bye. Awesome. Let's end.